good morning all the participants and uh, dignitaries and panelists respected panelists uh, myself dr cm hussain head of the department department of pharmaceutical technology mohan abul kalam ajad university of technology and program coordinator for today's <laughs> event i heartily welcome all the participants who have joined on particular national conference on recent trends in biomedical and clinical research Today we have with us Professor Soikot Mutro, he is the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Maulana Azad University of Technology, West Bengal. This is the largest technical university in the state. We have with us Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Ramesh Goel, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Dipsaru, New Delhi. We have with us uh, Professor N. Urupa. He is the director of research cell, research cell, SD University, and we have with us Professor Ponobis Chakraborty. He is the director of School of Pharmaceutical and Healthcare Technology, Macau, West Bengal. We have with us Professor Vishwajit Mukherjee. He is professor and former head of Department of Pharmaceutical Technology, and he is executive secretary of Indian Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists and Technologists. I have PhD shortly. We have also with us Dr. Subhash Chandra Dinda. He is departmental head professor in Mohabat Department of Pharmaceutics, Mohabat Kipthankar University, Moradabad, UP. We have uh, also with us respected Dr. Amrika Banachi of from East India Pharmaceutical Works Limited. Dr. Srinivas Mutalik. He is the head of the Department of Municipal Institute of Pharmaceutical Science, Department of Pharmaceutics. And Dr. Vishesh uh, Kaveri, Kaveshwar, and also uh, we have with us Ms. Dr. Mansa Deepa. She is a program uh, moderator. She is the head of the department, professor from East West College of Pharmaceutics, Department of uh, Pharmaceutics. Uh, another person uh, I'm saying uh, it's showing is still the name of Professor Uluba again. Yeah, our uh, secretaries, our secretaries. <laughs> No problem. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, I beg your pardon. I just forgot. I missed to mention that uh, Professor Urupa he is the president of IAPST. So this uh, conference, uh, national conference, is organized by Indian Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists and Technologists in collaboration with Department of Pharmaceutical Technology, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad University of Technology, SDM University, Karnataka, and East West College. Of pharmacy Bangalore. So, without wasting time, I request uh, Doctor. I, I would like to introduce uh, Doctor N. Urupa, who will give presidential address. Uh, uh, Urupa, uh, Professor Urupa, having 36 years of teaching and research experience, and uh, his research area in novel and targeted drug delivery system. Uh, he has research grant number of research grant more than 57. And he has visited 20 uh, international country, country abroad and national 65. He has guided more than 70 PhD students and MPHAM projects 150. He earned seven credits. So I would request Dr. Professor Urupa to deliver presidential address, please. So very good morning and happy Sunday. Uh, today, the 27th. Uh, March. So uh, we were preparing for this uh, particular uh, webinar, national, uh, international webinar, uh, since uh, last uh, two, three months. And uh, when we requested uh, our uh, institute secretary, uh, Dr. Vishwajit Mikuriji, and also contacted Abdul Kalam uh, University, the Honorable Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, and all the management, they agreed and also uh, we contacted our management, uh, 3D Virendra uh, the Chancellor of Dharma Salamanjanathishwar University and Vice Chancellor Dr. Niranjan Kumar <coughs> and uh, our uh, 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 administration head, <coughs> Sake Shetty and uh, <coughs> my colleague Dr. Kavishwar and other uh, dignitaries of uh, our SDM University. They were, they were very much thrilled and very much happy 
and they gave the consent and similarly the iapst was uh, kind enough and uh, with the help of uh, kolkata um, for the second or third time uh, webinar of course uh, next uh, the physical uh, meeting and uh, the actually I, uh, we are planning a rjm university is planning with the help of apr uh, october where iapst also part of it more than 1000 people uh, physically around 2000 people are respected so we'll be organizing on again this is a pilot the title is update on uh, clinical and uh, pharmaceutical biomedical research and uh, particularly we are focusing on uh, new technology nanotechnologies drug deliveries uh, devices uh, clinical research uh, and uh, uh, bab studies that is bioavailability bioequivalent studies uh, regulatory issues so for this we have shortlisted about five uh, very internationally reputed uh, the people as resource persons also very good the chair persons moderators are with us and uh, with the success of this particular uh, initiative one day webinar of about five to six resource persons and other uh, chair persons and uh, with these three universities again all these universities and our group iapst will be involved in the next event also october event with the gala mega event and uh, followed by maybe in 2013 we'll see that international conference of course iapst has planned in bangladesh nepal dubai sri lanka like that uh, the great because uh, because of the covid last 3 years we could not do good program but still Uh, we have we are publishing our uh, uh, news bulletin as well as uh, our journal with the leadership of uh, uh, dr bishwajit mukherjee and his team and uh, we are hopeful uh, the 2013 onwards physically every six months our all pending international conferences national events uh, workshops seminars uh, all these things uh, will be Uh, greatly uh, highlighted and uh, it will be implemented and executed and uh, we are happy to inform that with the leadership of dr bishwajit mukherjee which was uh, like the headquarters is in uh, uh, in uh, uh, jadavpur university in uh, kolkata but now we have come out and uh, nationally we have more than 8 to 10 zone wise we have every zone we have appointed uh, chief coordinators and a committee is formed and a uh, lot of uh, uh, events uh, in the collaboration with the ipa ipga and uh, community pharmacy association with the, the leadership of dr nagappa nayak we have already organized several programs and iapst many of us we are uh, we are honored we are given lot of awards and uh, we have we are the speakers and uh, we have agreed that we will collaborate and see that uh, we will make we will uh, organize several programs and also i am happy to inform that uh, this zone wise uh, we have started uh, various initiatives uh, like membership is uh, increasing and uh, the the we have given uh, to each zone leaders uh, the responsibility of increasing the membership it is not the only the number we want the quality quality the quantity of good quality members as well as uh, the good programs and good activities research related activities so for that because uh, that particularly in the area of uh, uh, pharmaceutical biomedical biotechnology nanotechnology emerging areas uh, thematic areas we want to uh, conduct a lot of research activity collaborative projects increase the membership and we want to give seed money and also give the mentorship and with this hope we'll be able to and we are happy to see that we have great leaders like eminent scientist and technologist like dr ramesh goel who is the vice chancellor he is the we first of all congratulate him for his second term extension for another 5 years because for last 10 years you were on other universities and you were the ms university baroda baroda the leader dial and he contributed a lot in gujarat 
and now he has come to delhi and uh, after 5 years again second uh, he has taken the responsibility and uh, he has built up the team and built up the and he has also agreed to support us at iapst and maybe delhi next time maybe within one year we will be able to organize a big event in his campus because very good to halls and other facilities are there and his team is already actively participating and helping us in this our iapst activities and uh, uh, already our uh, organizing committee has welcomed again once again i welcome our uh, uh, vice chancellor and uh, chancellor of the gurunanak university our guru uh, this uh, that university and also uh, professor goel and also uh, all heartedly uh, welcome uh, our my colleague dr vishwajit mukherji uh, dr dinda he has now come to delhi very near to the capital and he is also uh, this iapst is quite active and dynamic in uh, this leadership i also um, uh, welcome my own colleagues dr uh, vishwas kavishwar uh, my own colleague from manipal uh, dr Uh, Srinivas Guttalik and other uh, speakers and Dr. Sandeep Tiwari will be joining shortly and also Dr. Vasudev Shenai uh, and from uh, and his colleague uh, colleagues uh, Dr. Raviraj and other colleagues from uh, Manipal who are helping as resource person and all and also our uh, uh, Dr. our uh, previous president uh, Dr. Uh, um, please help me I'm forgetting his name our uh, Ambika uh, Banerjee. Uh, Ah, Amita, Amita, Amita Banerjee and uh, Manasa Deepa and also the all other uh, the, uh, other colleagues, uh, other speakers who are there with us, uh, and uh, uh, I am sure this one day uh, program will be successfully uh, organized and we will take away very good message with us. And also I uh, all heartedly congratulate uh, Dr. C M. uh uh hussein who is the organizing committee member and who has uh, and, and uh, dr masoon and dr manasa deepa who are uh, coordinating this particular program since last several uh, i think I, i should say at least last two months they are working very hard we have several meetings and everything is uh, perfect though this is sunday everything has been perfected and there is a very good panel discussion very good panelists are selected and i'm sure we will be enriched and will each one of us learn and add value to this particular program and our activities will be announced so once again i welcome all of you and i congratulate all of you and i uh, wish that our iapst will be it will overtake all the because particularly academic and research that is the main thing because always Vishwanath Mukherjee has told it is not the quantity; it is the quality. So even ten people who are there, a good quality. So we will be uh, we will mentoring and we will see that others are also motivated. So that it is uh, not the number, number of publication, number of uh, the the salary, the, the high salary we get. That is not the thing. The, the the best thing is the quality, high quality. It will yield in the long run. so that so that uh, even without the job we will be able to survive with our because our future researchers and all they will be uh, taking it uh, forward with this uh, brief introduction and uh, a brief message uh, by my presidential message i once again thank uh, all my colleagues and particularly dr vishwajit mukherjee and all the university officials and dr goel and all for uh, joining and supporting us so thank you very much that the great welcome and all the best wishes thank you thank you thank you professor rupa for your valuable speech uh, let me welcome uh, professor uh, dr bisojit mukherjee my respected mentor he is uh, ex executive uh, secretary of ipst and former head and, and now he is a professor of department of pharmaceutical technology to delhi bible college sir please good morning good morning respected professor soitor maitro honorable vice chancellor molana abul kalam 
Azad University of Technology, Professor Ramesh Goel, Vice Chancellor, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Delhi Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Research University, Dr. A. Nudupa, President, IAPST and Director Research Cell, STM University, Dr. Subhas Dinda, Secretary, IAPST and Professor and Head, Pharmaceutical Sciences Department, Tiptankar Mohammed University, Professor Pranobesh Chakraborty, Director, School of Pharmacy uh, and uh, Pharmacy and Health uh, Care Technology, University uh, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, University of Technology, Dr. Muhammad Nasiruddin Namdar, Principal East West College of Pharmaceutical uh, Pharmacy. Bengaluru, Dr. Ambika C. Banerjee, Corporate Advisor, East India Pharmaceutical Wax Limited, and Past President IAPST, Dr. Purnima Ashok, Dean R&D, East uh, West College of Pharmacy, uh, Pharmacy Bengaluru, Dr. Uh, Chaudhary Mobasar Hossein, Professor and Head Department of Pharmaceutical Technology, Maulana Abul Kalam Ajad University of Technology, Dr. Monsa Deepa, Head Department of Pharmaceutics, East West College of Pharmacy, Bengaluru, Honorable Speakers, Dr. Kaveswar, Dr. Mutalik, Dr. Asagraj, and Dr. Sandeep Tiwari, Dr. Manasri Hajra, Professor B.B. Barik, all other members of IAPST members directly involved or who are instrumental to organize this program of IAPST uh, account, that is Molan Abul Kalam Ajad University of Technology, SDM University, East West, College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, of course, the WebNet team, all the team members, all the delegates, ladies and gentlemen. So today is a nice moment for us to begin one national level conference through WebNet, and it is on the recent trends on biomedical and clinical research, which is going to be organized jointly by IAPST, Macau, SDM University, and of course, East West College of Pharmacy, Bengaluru. As we all understand that after the COVID-19, this is very important that biomedical research has got its new high. And clinical research, we understand that it will just progress like anything in future days. Day by day, we are just getting its improvement. And you know that people are just running after this because we need lots of new things in medicines, lots of new things in diagnostic materials as diagnostic material. New diseases are coming. So long the uh, earth will exist, you know, these problems will be there. New diseases will come, lots of mutated uh, virus, lots of, you know, uh, new strain of bacteria will come. You will all get exposed to these diseases. And of course, we have to find out the medicines against them. We have to find out the right diagnostic materials against them. This is very important for all of us. And this type of conference, and you know, seminars should be there to understand what exactly is going on throughout the globe, what people are doing. You see, we have a very uh, good selection of the speakers throughout the globe. We have had a speaker from India and as well as US also, and all the speakers are learned in their field. They will deliver whatever the new things to us so that we can be enriched, our delegates can be enriched, and it, that new things will enlighten us for future progress. So 
I wholeheartedly welcome you all, sir and madam. I wholeheartedly welcome all the delegates present here, distinguished guests, and let me believe that, let me consider that in next few hours, this will be really a uh, fruitful thing and which will just give some knowledge or which will actually incorporate some new thing, new knowledge to us so that we can enlighten ourselves. Thank you very much. I do not like to linger anything because so many speakers, so many learned people are here who will enrich all of our you know, participants. And I request all the participants, all the delegates to assimilate the knowledge from this learned speaker. I wish this particular conference 100% success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vishwanath uh, sir, for your enriched speech. Welcome, gatherings. Now, uh, it is indeed a great pleasure to introduce our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Soikot Muitro. Sir, uh, sir, is there? Yes, sir. Sir, this is sir. This is sir. Sir. Sir, sir is there, Professor? Uh, this is sir. Yes. Sir, this is sir. Yes. Okay. Sir, it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce our honorable vice chancellor, Professor Soikot Mitro, uh, who is a dreamy thought thought-provoking, active, and dynamic vice chancellor of the MacAut Moran Abul Kalam Ajit University of Technology. This is the largest technology university of the state. Professor Moitro is an eminent scholar, and he is a progressive academic leader in our country. Professor Moitro has been in, instrumenting towards academic excellence, employing pedagogy of deep questioning and research into learning delivery, and encouraging faculty, students, and staff on research innovation. Under the leadership of Professor Moitro, as a vice chancellor, Mac out of Bengal, is becoming the enabler of an academic ecosystem where modern teaching learning pedagogy is practiced, cutting edge technologies are promoted, and all kinds of digital tools are promoted for overall growth and development of all stakeholders and society at large in both letter and spirit. So without wasting time, I would request our honorable vice chancellor, Professor Swetat Mutro, to, to deliver uh, inaugural speech and inaugurate the program. Sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Hussain. At the outset, uh, I would like to say that uh, I uh, feel really honored to be invited uh, amongst all the luminaries, experts, and doyens in the field of pharmaceutical science and allied areas. Perhaps I am the odd man out. So when it is being said that uh, I am a, a dynamic one, so I would like to remind all of you that everyone is dynamic. No one is static in this, uh, you know, this moving universe. So the matter of fact is here, uh, probably for uh, as a rare occasion, this university has uh, forged alliance with uh, other organization to uh, organize one national seminar and on a very relevant and important topic. And the other organizers along with this university are Indian Association of Pharmaceutical Science and Technology, then uh, HTM University, East uh, West uh, College uh, of Pharmacy, and of course, uh, our uh, Department of Pharmaceutical Science and Technology from this university. This uh, topic is very interesting, recent trend in biomedical and clinical research. And uh, I would like to share some of my thoughts, which may sound as a layman's opinion and observation in this field without having a deep understanding for perhaps. The world is moving in such a, such a way that uh, very soon, maybe within a few years, we will be seeing a convergence of uh, information science and medical science or to be precise, biological science. Because if we study these, the 
the progress of human civilization and human race with the last few decades the knowledge gathered by human race in understanding the biology it is uh, unprecedented and uh, it never happened in the entire course of human journey so the entire subject of uh, medical research biological research and allied things that is under the process of transformation we gathered knowledge of our genetic compositions genetic maps we now have a profound understanding of uh, of all the uh, factors and uh, all the all the uh, reasons what uh, what is responsible for impacting our health uh, more and more we are gathering more and more uh, more information and uh, this is quite uh, evident from the fact that uh, numbers of uh, medical researches are coming up uh, which are conducive for uh, for making our life more uh, you know this uh, uh, with a more uh, more uh, disease free and more healthy and at the same time a longer period of life even 50 60 years before our average life span was not that which we are having right now and that has been possible because of the tremendous advancement in the field of medical research and biological research another interesting fact which is happening this life is shifting from organic paradigm to inorganic paradigm and because of this uh, replacement of many organic components of our body by inorganic um, parts in organic uh, you know, these items the life is more and more relying on silicon carbon was one of the fundamental is still now is one of the fundamental ingredient but our reliance on silicon is increasing more and more and that is uh, that is another interesting phenomenon the evolution which has happened as a process of natural biological uh, selection over a period of time in this century within maybe a few years uh, that will be a totally a uh, different things because this evolution which are going to happen which already has started happening in near future that will be most be controlled and determined by man human beings because of this the many uh, uh, manipulations of our body systems with uh, smart you know this uh, items smart uh, uh, articles our uh, uh, enter you know this uh, taking care of our body taking care of all the diseases taking care of life span that will be more and more under control so these are uh, the major facets of biological and medical research of the future i am uh, presently reading one of the uh, book uh, written by a famous historian yuval noah harari and what he has opined that human race is going to be transformed uh, into another species very uh, very soon maybe by 2050 and that migration will be from homo sapiens to homo deus that means we will be in charge of, of everything everything of our maybe life span maybe all sorts of you know this our our bigger uh, our health our all these things and uh, that is uh, that is uh, becoming possible more and more with the phenomenal growth in genetic research in the field of artificial intelligence in the uh, field of uh, sensors iot's in the field of data science and analytics in the field of all these uh, electronic gadgets which uh, are being used either outside of our body or inside of our body to taking care of the entire system medical research or biological research is not now is the only port or only domain of people belonging to the field of pharmaceutical science or biological science 
these are going to be these have already started being impacted by uh, from other fields as well from the field of electronics from the field of information technology from the field of computer science from the field of physics engineering and all these things so we now need to focus uh, in this particular fascinating you know this development which is happening in other parts of uh, the world how to uh, gain maximum benefit of all these latest developments in the in other areas and how to take leverage of all these things in making our uh, our our lifestyles our life systems our healthcare systems our medical systems more uh, efficient more effective more affordable more accessible more reliable so this is one of the biggest challenge but still now we do not have a homogeneous atmosphere prevailing in the entire globe we have a different dimension of challenge existing in, uh, at our country considering the vast population considering the vast diversity considering the diversity in income diversity uh, in uh, in race diversity in cultures and all these things so here you know this making a uh, healthcare systems a quality uh, quality bearing uniform and accessible to all the section of population it is a difficult and daunting task but now uh, with this research in the in medical research biomedical research clinical research are now opposing uh, in that direction to take uh, benefit and to take uh, support and to get transforms with the with the interference or with the intrusions of other fields uh, so that it it is it becomes a realistic scenario that people residing at the remotest corners of the country they get benefits of all these things all this let us develop it these are happening and maybe uh, it is taking time but within few within maybe one or two decades we will be seeing that technology has made it possible to uh, provide healthcare systems uh, in a uh, in an accessible and affordable manner to this course of population drug research are also undergoing a tremendous change because they like, time is coming for personalization and customization so customized medicine personalized medicine but is all this uh, smart insert inside the body they taking care of our aging population with all the sensors the gadgets in a remotely uh, you know this uh, design systems cloud remotely design cloud based systems insertion of many nanobots inside our body to track the uh, growth of abnormal cells to mitigate all these problems at the very beginning not to allow not not to allow cancerous cells to grow and at the same time uh, there uh, there are customized medicine depending on our genetic composition genetic makeup which are most efficient and most effective to uh, combat all the diseases uh, which may happen in futures because lots of things are happening also because of the genetic uh, cultures more interference of human being with the nature numbers of viruses are becoming more and more active and researchers are also uh, maybe in line with all these things to combat all these unforeseen challenges of the future so i believe that uh, here in this platform with the inputs of different experts and joins from different fields a culture of networking and collaboration will emerge amongst all the research communities to take care of all the challenging scenarios of the future and uh, this is one of the biggest advantage that uh, through the digital platform we are in a uh, position we are able to com communicate and connect and to organize these types of uh, webinars and seminars at uh, at our uh, uh, weekend involving many experts many participants in this field this is another another interesting development of uh, digital technology uh, of present and in near future it will be more and more engaging because 
Now, with the advent of 5G networks, with the advent of AR and VR, these types of web seminars and interactions will be more lively, more interacting, more engaging. Now, let us focus on all the latest developments in other fields, how to combine all these things to make it a multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary research to take care of the future of human race and to make our life more robust, more robust, more, you know, this, uh, free from all these, uh, all, all sorts of diseases, all sorts, of, maybe, maybe it may be from uh, pres uh, the viruses of present, viruses of future, or other sorts of microbes or all sorts, all sorts of things. But this, this, uh, this is, should be our mandate as a whole. And uh, I believe that all of us are uh, really prepared and geared up to take up the challenges challenging task of this uh, present and future. So recent trend and future trend, everything will be discussed and deliberated. I would like to congratulate the organize, all the organizers who are uh, taking part at this particular national conference. And my sincerest thanks to all the resource persons who will be sharing their knowledges. Probably this will be captured properly and this will be made available through digital platform for uh, consumption for the use of, of the learning community of uh, who are not in a position to take part at today's conference, because this is another advantage. Whatever is being deliberated and being, you know, this uh, presented that remains forever for uh, further utilization and use for learning community. And my sincerest uh, congratulations to all the participants who remain present at the, at weekend sacrificing their leisure time and pastimes for to, uh, to in search of the useful knowledge from this particular conference. So with this, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much. Now I'm requesting Dr. Hoshan to take this program forward. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Visitor. Thank you so much for your enriched and valuable speech on this particular national conference. Uh, highlighting all the emerging areas and significant field of biomedical, pharmaceutical, and healthcare technology research, and projecting the trans future trans transformation in days to come. Thank you, sir. Now I would request uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Dipsaru, uh, Professor Ramesh Goel, sir, to Professor Ramesh Goel, sir. Yes, yes, uh, I'm aware. I'm here. Of honor of the conference to deliver your speech, please, sir. Okay. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Professor Udupa for inviting me. Also, the other members of this Indian Association of the Pharmaceutical Scientists and Technologies. Professor Mukherjee, Dr. Dinda, and especially I'm thankful to the Vice Chancellor of the University, who has really given a great insight of what is happening and what is required by people like us, by the scientists like us, as a pharmacologist. I'm Vice Chancellor, but I feel I'm a professor first, then Vice Chancellor, forget all other things. So uh, I'm still trying to get involved in research also at times, but difficult. I think Dr. Avar, uh, uh, Dr. Saikat can easily understand this, but this I must compliment the association for bringing out such a program. And as uh, rightly pointed out, it is all because we are, can do it online. Offline, it would not have been possible. Last week, when I called Dr. Odupa, where is that program? And you have told me to block that date. And then I told, no, it is on the other date. So just yes, yesterday, I could get this confirmation. And today, I'm here. Otherwise, to travel to Kolkata was impossible. Anyway, now, coming to like this association, we it's rightly pointed out that pharmaceutical sciences and technology there is a misconception sometimes that pharmacy means it is more dealing with only community pharmacy in the form of shops or manufacturing 
and that to the chemicals. But pharmacy is such a field, it is so dynamic that it encompasses many more things. I have been a pharmacologist and in the beginning I used to say that pharmacologists are like beggars. They, we beg from different disciplines, biochemistry, zoology, botany, chemistry, clinics, uh, sociology, law and everything. That's how we become the person. Same thing holds true here. But adding what has gone in the technology, what COVID has taught us is much more and that is what has to be taken note of it. Incidentally, yesterday itself, one of my colleagues forwarded one important document. And in this five minutes, I'm going to talk only about that. It was something like a health, uh, uh, health arc, the top healthcare innovations in 2021. I think that itself will give a big, uh, I mean, whatever I could have thought of giving today, I'm going to present that. What happened that somebody took a list of 2021 innovations. See, innovation is the key now. now. And in that, how it will impact the healthcare as a whole in the world, I mean, not even in the particular region or so, in the whole world. And they have some sort of marking system and based on that, they gave this top 10 innovations in the healthcare. Out of which I found three are related to directly drugs. I mean, drugs means chemical type or simple structure. Three are antibodies, two are medical devices, and one is related to diagnostics and one is related to medical device, a prevention measure. Now this itself, the very, the very top list tells us that when we think of pharmaceutical technology and pharmaceutical sciences, it should not restrict to mere chemicals. We are doing as pointed out by our, by our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Saikar, that nanotechnology, Yes, it is important, but there are many things beyond that also. Now coming to drugs, in my 1970s, I learned something like pilocarpine. And this pilocarpine, such a simple drug, cholinergic drug, can it be innovation? Can there be some innovation in that? It is real, real surprising to see me that list and in that list, it was pilocarpine and pilocarpine VTD, the, the ophthalmic solution, wherein it is been used to have the low vision people, the narrow vision, near low vision can use this, utilizing the constriction part of the body itself and use it. And this is a no innovation and it has been approved. So it is the drug that has been approved for the low vision and age-related blurry vision. What a beauty, I mean. Okay, I'm not talking only old. The another important thing was the semaglutinide. That is the, like we are talking of the weight loss, but chronic weight loss. If you ask somebody for weight loss to go on taking one drug, Rebionavent was one and it was thrown out because of the psychological problem. Now they have come out with one drug, which is a GLP agonist, GLP-1 agonist. And we have seen the successes in the diabetes related to this target. And what we found now that they have developed this drug for a chronic, it will be just one injection per week. My God, what, is, what a sort of innovation it is. Of course, new drug, new formulation, new methodology. Then third, insulin. Now we talk of the cardiovascular diseases, but we are talking of cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and this is the insulin is something again, a low cholesterol is recycled and it is given. That is what is the innovation. Innovation means a new drug discovery, new drug formulation and like that. 
Now, going further, we all know that uh, if you take out the list of last five, uh, five, seven years, many of the new drugs are related to monoclonal antibodies and antibodies. It is not a surprise. Even in the COVID, we had toxizumab. Now, here it is adunicanab, which is used for, which has been proposed for the Alzheimer's disease. And this is the first drug to slow cognitive decline in the people living with Alzheimer's. What is the uniqueness is that it utilizes amyloid beta directed targets there. What a wonder, I mean. And then, so this is the drug for the proposed for the Alzheimer's. Then we go beyond, it is one another drug, which is, I mean, uh, this is the antibody which has been developed. Then is the dosaterimab. Now, dosaterimab is something for the endometrial cancer. Now, see, treatment of cancer, yes, monoclonal antibodies have played the role, we all know. But what is the beauty of this uh, uh, endometrial cancer is that it is a, it is, has uh, targeted the program death one, PD-1 receptor blocker, which is again a unique target, unique method, unique uh, apoptosis, what we are talking is being attacked here. This is what is the beauty of this new target. Well, this is also uh, the another antibody. And uh, then, now when the insulin came, humulin came, now we have got erythropoietin, many other things. So biosimilars is a big field by itself. And biosimilar in 2021, we got one more, the first rather, it is claimed to be the first, uh, uh, first interchangeable biosimilar, like Lente and how can you interchange? This, this is the first one which has come up and it is going to go a long way. We know the, I don't want to tell what, what is the cardiovascular disease and diabetes, all that. So this is another thing which has come up. Now, so monoclonal antibodies and new targets and new drugs, like ACE2, I consider as one of the important target in the COVID. And I am, our university is working on that part. Now coming to the third one, the medical devices. First time it has the realization that medical devices, how important are they? Not just the oximeter or like that, but beyond that also. Ventilator, oximeter. So this is the oxygen concentrator like that. Now here, the two devices have come up in this 2021, which are the latest. And those medical devices, now one medical device is uh, tracheal. Now, many times the trachea is being used, many times tracheostomy and all that. Children, they die of the trachea many times. But nobody thought of having trachea implant. And first tracheal implant has been developed. So that is the transplantation of the first human tracheal transplantation has been shown. This is a, another thing which has come up. And I have been, we are having a physiotherapy department and we found that in the knee, the acute ACL, arcuate ligament, I mean, that where the dancers and all, they get disturbed or jumpers or something. And then their lifetime, it is a problem for them. Now, one come, has come up, somebody has come up, that is called BEAR, beer, the Bridge Enhanced ACL Restoration. This is an implant. This is a novel medical device which has been coming up. This is, that's why they, they rank that top 10, I mean, of the all 120 plus innovations which were brought to the notice. So, apart from medical devices, antibodies, and drugs, the prevention is important. So mosquito, and mosquito is also another reason. So prevention of the malaria itself, for years together, decades together, vaccine has been come uh, in with there, but it is, it seems that now for the vaccine, prevention of malaria, first and to date only vaccine has come up in the name of RTS, mosquito, mosquito is the trade name. This is what is another one which has come up. 
and in the prevention there is another thing which has come uh, is the that it is for the uh, the ldl cholesterol so anyways lastly when we talk of this pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences diagnostics is also equally important we have seen the power now nobody knew what is rt pcr and now every normal individual layman knows what is rt pcr there is something like rt pcr at least for diagnosis now in the diagnostics the imaging played an important role the many psychiatric disorders can be identified by pet scanning okay cat scanning and all is known but pet scanning did it based on that of course the drdo got new drug but here they developed one the setelux is the one of the other that they, for the ovarian cancer detection they have developed one fluorescent dye and that has come up cytolux prophylaxin that is one of cn lesson that is what is a new drug so what i am trying to tell out of this in a uh, in the 5 minutes time i wanted to summarize that when we are looking at such what dr udupa said that quality of the people that is what is required and the work in the innovation something out of box thinking and how to really utilize the hardcore knowledge how the changing technology have to be understood if you read this i think then i mean if this becomes a very important part so i am really amazed in the yeah, last night only i got this mail and i in the morning i thought let let me share this only so i am once again thankful and yes uh, dr dupa we will plan if it is if you want to have it in delhi next year we will see that and definitely we will uh, see that uh, membership uh, whatever we can do we will do that and once again i am thankful to all and uh, for having me as the guest of honor and participate in this beautiful conference thank you very much sir. thank you thank you sir thank you so much yeah. thank you professor ramesh gol sir for uh, delivering excellent uh, speech discussing uh, new drugs different drugs antibodies and medical devices thank you so much uh, now i would request uh, dr subhas chandra dinda he is the secretary of iipsc uh, currently he is working as a professor and head of the department of pharmaceutics college of pharmacy pithankar mohabir university moradabad up india i would request dr dinda to say few words on conference morning everyone am i audible clearly yes sir yeah. yes you so, honorable the respected professor saikat maitro the chief patron the honorable vice chancellor of maulana abul kalam azad university of technology the chief patron of today's event and professor rk goel sir the honorable vice chancellor of delhi uh, pharmaceutical science and research university uh, the chief guest of today's event uh, professor n udupa the president of iipst professor biswajit mukherji the uh, secretary general of iipst uh, dr pranabesh chakravarti the all invited the distinguished guests and research persons and the delegates and all my dear participants first of all i would like to thanks the organizer for giving me this opportunity to address the keynotes on this uh, auspicious occasion and uh, so uh, i feel proud to be with uh, uh, all of you to share uh, the information Uh, basing on which the IAPST builds or stands. So at the outset, I would like to say you that Indian Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists and Technologists, headquarters at Jadavpur University, Kolkata, was established in the year 2004 by the pharmacy professionals to bring a common platform for pharmaceutical uh, scientists and technologists engaged in different fields of pharmacy, such as industries. 
academics and the field of pharmacy practice to assist each other to flourish the pharmacy profession. IAPST highlights the problems along with possible solution faced by professionals in the field and try to bring common platform for industry institute interactions and IAPST published International Journal of Pharmaceutical Science and Technology uh, into, uh, started in 2008 for professional development. Since its inception, IAPST conducted several convention seminar each year at national level and international conferences on the topics of current research interest in the field of pharmaceutical and biotechnological aspects in different states of India, as well as recognized and awarded several scientists and professionals for their contribution to the field of pharmacy profession. During its course of journey, it has already become a proud member of uh, International Ph Pharmaceutical Feder Federation, Netherlands. It has done number of uh, national and international conferences, seminars, workshops, and training programs, webinars, either individually or in collaboration with the institutions. The organization has already awarded number of national and international reputed scientists, academics, and industrial professionals. It is worthy to mention a few of them, such as Professor Peter Banas from Germany, Professor C.K. Kokate, Professor N.K. Jain, Dr. Himadri Seren from industry, Professor A.K. Bandapadai from Jadapur University, Professor P.N. Murthy, Professor N. Udupa, Professor G.P. Mahanta, Professor Madhusudan Rao, Professor R.N. Saha, Professor R.N. Gupta, and so many more. And it is used to publish a journal of international uh, report and uh, on the pharmaceutical science and technology. It has started in its journey that has no end. It will only work with the interest of common men for lowest cost of best medicine. Now, after facing the COVID-19 pandemic, now uh, more responsibility lies on this organization and we are emphasizing on conducting national, international level seminars and conferences, emphasizing on the biomedical and clinical research. They are by scientists will emphasize on this area, which is a current research interest and required for the uh, giving the better solution at this pandemic situations for the country. So this uh, profession started, this organization started uh, the association, the present uh, Executive members include Professor N. Urupa is the president, myself is the executive secretary, and Professor Biswamit Mukherjee is the secretary general of IPST. Professor Uj Dr. Ujjal Mandal, the manager, manager of Days Medical, become the secretary and of finance. Miltu Ghosh uh, is Dr. Miltu Ghosh, the deputy secretary of the headquarters. And uh, Dr. Manasa Deepa uh, is the secretary of the South Zone and Dr. Gurudat Patnaik, secretary of the uh, East Zone. So the founding uh, executive members include Dr. Ambikasi Banerjee, Professor A.K. Bandapadai, Dr. Banasri Hajra, Professor B.B. Barik, Professor U.C. Banerjee, Ujjal Mandal, uh, Dr. Biswajit Mukherjee, Professor Anupal, uh, and myself. So along with maybe the membership increased to, increase to 300 numbers throughout the country. And we have conducted several uh, seminars and conferences. Now we are emphasizing on the seminar conferences looking to the pandemic situation on the virtual mode. And I am very much thankful to Dr. Uh, Moitra, uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Maulana Abul Kalam Ajad University to allow us to host the programs and Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor R.K. Goyal sir, which is valuable schedule event, he accepted our invitation and present with us and shared very, very valuable information, which is a current um, uh, research interest. And uh, I am thankful to everybody for giving me this opportunity. So now I hand over to the Dr. Hussein uh, for uh, conducting further because Everybody is waiting uh, for uh, listening the deliberation from the experts or the resource persons. So uh, with this, I hand over the microphone to the uh, Dr. C.M. Hossein, and I'm thankful to him also. He's a, or, uh, made to, to a lot of leadership in organizing function and uh, Dr. Manasa Deepa, uh, who took uh, very initiativeness for organizing this function. So I hope uh, this function will be a great success and I am very much thankful to all the resource persons and the uh, our distinguished guests 
to be with us uh, by sharing their valuable knowledge and uh, information with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you one and all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dinda, for delivering your enriched keynote uh, speech. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, now, let me introduce our uh, director of our School of Pharmaceutical and uh, Healthcare Technology of Macau, Trust Bengal, Professor Punavish Chakraborty. He is my mentor. Uh, you know, he is a stalwart person in the field of pharmaceutical technology. He has more than 37 years of experience in teaching and he is uh, he is the founder of more than three college and uh, currently is working as a director in the school of pharmaceutical and healthcare technology of this university so i would request professor prabhas chakraborty to deliver your speech please sir uh, 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 thank you uh, dr hussain uh, for all I am extending Shuprabhat and a very good morning to our honorable and most thought-provoking Vice Chancellor, sir, of Molana Abu Kalamaja University of Technology, which was previously known as, formerly known as West Bengal University of Technology, Professor Suikat Maitro. He is not only thought-provoking, he induced the acceleration in all kinds of all segments of science and technology and the professional field. I especially thankful, I am especially thankful to Professor Dr. Ramesh Quill, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Deputy Delhi Pharmaceutical Sciences and Research University, New Delhi, a legend of pharmaceutical technology. We are really happy that Professor Goel he is with us today. I am really thankful to AIPST that they have collaborated their national program with our university and our university vice chancellor has extended all types of uh, helps for making this program successful. Respected Professor Uzupa, Research Director, SDM University. Professor Vishwajit Mukherjee, former head de Department of Pharmaceutical Technology, Jadapur University. Dr. Rombika Banerjee, uh, advisor, East India Pharmaceutical Works, and, and the legend in the uh, research activities and how to progress with the manufacturing areas and research areas for one of the leading and very old pharmaceutical works that is East India. Professor Monsadip, Dr. Monsadipa, head Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Technology, East West College, Bengaluru. She is from the very inception, I have heard from Dr. Masum Choudhury, Dr. C. M. Hussain, that she is honestly, continuously tried to make this program a successful one. Dr. Purnima Ashok Jin, East West College, Bengaluru, Professor Dr. Dinda, respected speakers of this national seminar on recent trends in medical, biomedical, and clinical research, and our other respect and stalwarts of the pharmaceutical sciences and technology from different parts of India and abroad, learned faculty members from different colleges and universities, esteemed directors from different colleges and universities, and our beloved students who have joined this seminar. I request my affectionate students that today, whole of the day, the Vibrant discussion will continue with the help of our stalwart speakers from India and abroad. You take note of it. You interact with them so that today and tomorrow you can add value with your, your works and knowledge. 
on behalf of the university i am welcoming all the joins and stalwarts of our technology and conveying our heartfelt warm regards and wishes to make this webinar a grand success thank you thank you all thank you sir thank you professor for your valuable speech so now i would uh, hand up uh, hand over to dr monsadipa to continue the session thank you thank you dr masum uh, i request uh, mr prem to uh, assist me the technical related uh, matters uh, i can understand uh, we all are waiting uh, and the delegates are uh, waiting to hear for the scientific session from the various uh, uh, intellectual people those who are uh, with us today um, uh, please go ahead with the slide presentation mr prem quickly before we begin with this uh, scientific session i request all the delegates to so here please mute your uh, put your mobile phone in a mute mode and do not uh, 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 raise the question because we encourage with the questions uh, for the at the end of the talk at the end of the session we are going to announce the best question will be appreciated with an award so i always believe the words of the albert einstein the important thing is not to stop questioning so i request all the delegates to raise the question at the end of the talk of every session the speaker will uh, be connected with you uh, and along with your question uh, please go ahead so today with the let me begin with our scientific session with uh, dr vishwas kavishwar assistant professor in department of biochemistry uh, sdm university dharwad for this i request sir n udupa sir uh, i president iapst and dr dinda secretary iapst to chair the session and to introduce our uh, honorable speaker to the delegates over to you sir professor udupa sir over to you uh yeah so welcome to all of you uh thank you dr mansa dipa so i have great honor to introduce our uh, very learned speaker dr vishwas kavishwar who is my colleague professor in department of biochemistry at west bengal university darwad he is the innovation patent uh, the uh, innovation uh, director of our sdm university darwad he is serving in sdm university as in charge of central research laboratory coordinator of department of innovation and member secretary of university institutional ethics committee dr kavishwar completed his master degree in medical biochemistry in kasturba medical college bangalore manipal academy of higher education during his stay in germany dr kavishwar completed his phd and post doctoral studies from university of bonn germany and worked in medical device company before returning back to home land in 2018 his areas of research interest are dr kavishwar are uh, national university include uh, various uh, like uh, bio, uh, molecular biology then uh, uh, pharmacogenomics uh, stem cell research etc and also understanding molecular pathophysiology of uh, conformational diseases mitochondrial dis functional diseases with the help of ipsc based disease models so with this brief introduction uh, now i request dr kavishwar to um, uh, go ahead and present uh, his uh, uh, talk to this learner audience of iapst we welcome I, dr uh, vishwas kavishwar uh, amongst us as uh, honorable speaker thank you over to you dr kavishwar uh, you can share your slides uh, uh thank you so much sir let me share my presentation uh so please confirm if we can yes we can, we can please put in uh, presentation mode it would be 
please in presentation mode yeah make it full screen full screen yeah it is in full screen sir uh, no put it oh, sir you have to just switch on the full screen uh, share screen oh, yes. share screen you have to share the full screen i think one second is a cup like symbol just you click yeah sir restare it screen and uh, click on the entire screen stop yeah. the sharing and restare it yes sir while sharing you click on the entire screen sir first option entire screen is it okay can you see the full screen now yes perfect yes. please perfect perfect yeah all right uh, thank you so much and uh, before i continue uh, my presentation i would like to add a couple of things what uh, professor ramesh goel sir uh, mentioned regarding the innovation and uh, especially he mentioned about uh, semiglutide uh, which is being used as a uh, obesity drug and for diabetes uh, so basically one injection for entire week Uh, sir i would like to inform you that uh, semaglutide is also now being considered for alzheimer's disease so this is again a new uh, innovation probably you would see in the next year or maybe another 3 years after clinical trials just a little information i wanted to add to professor goel's uh, 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 whatever lecture okay so i would like to present my uh, topic which is ethics in uh, clinical trials so what is ethics uh, so basically it's a part of philosophy so we need to understand a little bit about what is philosophy so philosophy is a field which attempts to explain concepts related to the dynamics sorry yeah so the dynamics of everything associated with universe based on the systematic and rational thinking for the betterment of uh, chosen system so philosophy is uh, it is everywhere it is uh, it applies to everything um, it applies to universe and beyond yet it is system bound so when we say system bound it is for example i am a system you are a system we are all a system and then when we are a system we have associations with uh, uh, there are affiliations we we possess so we have it's my body my home my city my country your home your city your country your world your religion language and all these things so when we have these possessions values come and when there are values then we have do's and don'ts so basically good and bad so ethics lies between good and bad so this is absolute basic of ethics that we want to discuss uh, however ethics might seem uh, white and black which is good and bad but it is it comes in uh, various shades of gray so we have good right wrong bad so there is not much difference between good and right when it comes to me or me as a system but if i am taking a decision be, uh, on behalf of let's say my institute then it becomes a little more difficult so when i am taking decisions on behalf of my state or country then it becomes really really difficult it's not that simple anymore so uh, to sort of navigate through all this ethics uh, there are certain guidelines and which we will imply to clinical uh, field as well so yeah so these dilemmas are presented on a couple of in, in the form of couple of theories which are utilitarianism and deontology now utilitarianism is basically result oriented and deontology is process oriented so to give an example let's say um, there is a village and then there is only one pound in that village and 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 the person who owns that pound he is not willing to provide the water from that pound to the rest of the village uh, so it's for the greater good uh, so do we force him to give the water to the rest of the village or we just leave it to his uh, decision or his uh, will uh, so we have to think about the greater good and the process so result oriented would be we force him we force him and we ask him no 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 it's important that you provide water to everybody so we force him to do that and deontology is like we go with his wish because that's what is deontology 
Um, now, the decision, I wouldn't say one is correct and the other one is not, uh, but the decision basically uh, is based on three things. Objective, what exactly you want to achieve, the system, and priority. I'll give you another example. Let's say there is a hole in the center of the earth and uh, somehow that needs to be monitored properly or we do not need to, um, uh, or we are not supposed to build anything on top of that hole because maybe it's a pressure point or whatever. Right, but then that is owned by one person. Can we now force him to give away that land so that we can take care of it for the betterment of, or so that the world doesn't explode? It's a very, uh, you know, a sci-fi kind of a, a thing that we can talk about. So in that case, yes, we can do that. So again, it, there is no correct or wrong. So there is this always dilemma. So that can be uh, approached with uh, objectives and different objectives and system and priority, what priority we have. Based on that, we can take a call. Uh, of course, bioethics, which uh, is a branch of that. So it is the study of ethical issues emerging from, uh, emerging uh, from advances in biology and medicine. Bioethics are concerned in the ethical questions that arise in the relationships amongst uh, among life sciences, biotechnology, medicine, and medical ethics, politics, law, theology, and philosophy. Um, I have quoted the paper which uh, they mentioned bioethics. Uh, okay, uh, of course, we further move to clinical research because that's the main topic. Now, clinical research. So clinical research investigates questions about human disease, diagnosis, prevention, outcomes and treatments and about promoting health and health care. So basically it deals with improving standard care in, is one of the main aims of clinical research. So now clinical research can be observational, it can be interventional. Um, now observational is mostly health or economic research or maybe you want to understand um, uh, the quality of life for a certain uh, disease uh, uh, patient. And, and then interventional is probably we want to come up with a new, as Professor Goel mentioned, I can actually give an example there. Uh, so clinical trials. So clinical trials would be uh, mostly interventional studies. So clinical trials is the core of clinical research, uh, but mostly interventional studies. So clinical trials, collection of data on the safety and efficacy of health interventions. And they are thought by some to be the gold standard of clinical research. As I said, that's the core of clinical research, but then clinical research does not necessarily mean only clinical trials. It's everything associated with clinical trials. It's how it is managed and, and the people who are involved in it and the whole ethics committee that is, uh, uh, that is involved in this. So the, the regulatory aspects. So all of it together is clinical research and clinical trials is supposed to be the core of it. Uh, for example, investigating semaglutide in people with early Alzheimer's disease. So that is under clinical trials right now, as um, I already mentioned about it. Um, product development in healthcare. Um, so just to understand where ethics lies in this grand scheme of, uh, you know, uh, drug development. So of course, we have three stages. We have preclinical, we have clinical and postclinical. So in preclinical, we have, you know, screening of the drugs. Then we go for POC, which is proof of concept, process development. We have animal studies. Uh, we have reference standards, stability studies. And then we go for GMP, good manufacturing practices. And then we apply for uh, IND, which is investigational new drug. Uh, once the IND application is successful, then we go for clinical trials for phase one, phase two, phase three, and so on and so forth. And, and then process validation, et cetera. So once the clinical trials are successful, then we go for new drug application and we submit the whole thing and it is reviewed and either DCG or FDA approval is given and then it goes to the market. Now, where do we find ethics here? Um, so at the preclinical stage, uh, of course, we have some other regulatory aspects. We have biosafety. Uh, we have to, let's say if you're working with a recombinant uh, biologics or a recombinant product, then we have to go for a biosafety approval. They have to assess that uh, what, we are being, what we are using is safe. Then we go for IEC, which is Institutional Ethics Committee. Uh, we'll talk about DHR and CDSCO in, in the next slides. Um, just let, let's say if you're doing any in vitro studies and probably we are collecting sample uh, 
patient sample or a subject sample just to understand let's say molecular pathophysiology of a certain disease or maybe to understand how a drug is binding to certain protein or how a biologics is uh, working uh, in certain patients so we take iec for that we have of course animal ethics if you are using mouse or something or any of the animals for for these uh, uh, studies and then there is icscr which is institutional committee for stem cell research so if you are using stem cells which is these days a lot of people are working on a lot of uh, new avenues have come up uh, because of these stem cell research so if you are working on stem cells then obviously we need uh, approval from uh, stem cell research uh, institutional committee for stem cell research then of course we have ind and, and when we go for so when we go for uh, clinical trials we have yeah, yeah, yeah. irb or iec which is uh, uh, institutional review board or again institutional ethics committee uh, which is meant for clinical trials alone so now iec dhr that i am talking about is for the biomedical research and iec here would be for clinical trials in america it is mentioned as irb uh, institutional uh, review board in european countries it is uh, iec would be independent ethics committee in, in india we basically go for institutional ethics committee all right so clinical research and trials so when do we approve or when a certain clinical trials is approved so these are the criteria um the foreseeable risks of the subjects are low the ethics committee really looks into the foreseeable risks and whether you know they are low uh the negative impact on the subject's well being is minimized and low the trial is not prohibited by law and the inclusion criteria needs to be justified if there are any exceptions to these then that needs to be justified as well so if upon satisfactory justification of all these things uh the institutional ethic committee uh gives approval to conduct uh clinical trials further so bottom line um, what we want to say and, and why ethics committee exists in the whole clinical trials the bottom line is so according to icsc gcp e6 r2 uh, participants safety well being and protection of participants right is at most priority so the number one priority is participant safety and well being and then of course protection of participants right and then also clinical data integrity we make sure that there is no manipulation in the clinical data so again there are you know uh, when we talk about clinical trials uh, this is how it is generally organized so we have a sponsor or a manufacturing company uh, of certain drug and then they need to test or try those uh, drugs in patients or in subjects um for that they can either directly approve uh, approach sites now sites are generally these hospitals um, clinics or healthcare centers um or they can come through cros you now cros are contract research organizations and some people refer to them as clinical research organizations who basically sort of bridge between uh, the act as a bridge between sponsor and site they organize clinical trials on behalf of sponsor at site so they sort of um look after everything uh, though the main guys are still sponsor and site so they are like subcontracted now in cro uh, there are people who work for the sponsor or work in those particular projects so we have those monitors we call them monitors we also have clinical research associates we have cts clinical trial assistants and of course in site we have the investigator um, the doctors uh, and the subjects are recruited in the site um, and then the actual trial is actually taken place in the site or the hospital so the clinical study team so clinical study team would have generally these people uh, we have a monitor from clinical uh, research organization or clinical uh, or contracted research organization so they are the one who are pretty much coordinating between everybody so they are at the center if the cro is involved sometimes the sponsors are directly talking to sites and then the sites are conducting uh, clinical research on their own but then they will also have somebody who would be looking after these things um we have of course the pi principal investigator who is the main doctor uh, who is responsible for the clinical trials uh, we have pharmacist uh, who takes care of the drug and the storage of drug and you know the assessment of drugs we have and who is also uh, 
sometimes responsible for uh, um, this random ra randomization of these uh, blinding of these drugs. Um, we have study nurse who's helping the principal investigator. We have lab technicians, we have data managers, and we have clinical trial assistants. So these make generally a clinical study team. Of course, otherwise we also have data analysts, so that we have project managers, but they're at the different level, either from the sponsor side or from uh, clinical research organization side. So key part is in clinical trials. Uh, so we have basically four people. So this is what we are going to discuss today. So their roles and responsibilities with respect to ethics in clinical trials. So one is institutional review board or independent ethics committee uh, or in India, institutional ethics committee. So we have investigator, which is a principal investigator. We have sponsor and then we have a monitor. Um, so sorry, we cannot see this. Okay, now, so these people, I mean, these entities, institutional ethics, or I would refer to them as IEC, IEC investigator and sponsor are basically responsible for patent uh, patient protection and uh, they are also responsible for informed consent processes smoothly performed. Um, so principal, the main roles, uh, you know, IEC, Primary objective is subject protection, I just mentioned, uh, risk benefit analysis and assessing written information for the subjects. Whereas investigators, uh, they're responsible for informed consent, of course, in, 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 um, um, in, uh, so in coordination with IEC and, uh, and, and sponsor, they come up with these informed consent process. They do look for medical care and then safety reporting is what they take care of. Uh, sponsors, uh, risk benefit analysis, of course, uh, again, they are the ones who are going to submit the risk benefit analysis to the institutional uh, ethics committee. Uh, and, and they have to analyze it or they have to assess it. They go for safety reporting, developing written subject information. And the monitors uh, are from the CRO, the persons from CRO, uh, they coordinate uh, the functions of the stakeholders, including the subjects. Now, roles and responsibilities uh, in ethics. So what are the roles and responsibilities of sponsor? So sponsors are mainly uh, responsible for implementation of robust quality management, regulatory and ethics, ethical compliance system. So they have to come up with SOPs where uh, it should be clearly mentioned how ethical compliance should be uh, maintained and make sure that there is no, uh, they don't deviate from the ethical compliance. Um, and uh, through all stages of the trial process. They are responsible for risk management, uh, quality assurance and control, medical expertise, trial design and management, investigator selection, uh, compensation, submission to regulatory authorities, uh, safety information, uh, monitoring, et cetera. Now, investigator, key role of ethics, uh, in, in, with respect to ethics, what investigators are supposed to do? They protect the welfare of the study subject. Uh, they must adhere to ICH GCP E6 guidelines, Nuremberg codes, which is basically taking consent. Um, so seek, of course, they, you know, formulate the uh, informed consent uh, form, and then seek the review and approval from uh, institutional ethics committee. And they update new developments or amendments periodically uh, in the SOPs or trial form or master trial forms, uh, master trial uh, files, and uh, take periodic approval from IEC and IRB. And very importantly, neither the investigator nor any trial staff should unduly influence the subject to participate or to continue participate in the trial. So they cannot sort of put pressure in any way um, for example, they cannot cite that, you know, oh, I would not uh, provide you treatment for some other disease if you don't participate in this. Uh, so they cannot really put any sort of influence or pressure on the subjects to take part in the uh, uh, trials or to continue to take part in the trials. So this is the most important thing that investigators should remember. And it keeps happening if they're not really well aware of this. And also, they make sure that no document, uh, of course, this is also with respect to uh, ethics committee. 
So the no document indicates release of investigator, in, uh, institution, or sponsor from liability for negligence. So because of you know maybe there is certain liability and because that has risen because of negligence of any of these three, uh, make sure that you know there is no uh, nothing in the document which gives them free pass to sort of you know get away with this. Uh, and uh, material should not suggest or infer waiving of subjects legal rights in favor of investigator institution or the sponsor so this is extremely important when they are making uh, their forms at the same time this is also the responsibility of ethics committee so we'll come to the ethics committee so as i already mentioned uh, we have these irbs institutional review boards that mentioned as institutional review boards mostly in, in states in uh, in europe they are in independent ethics committee in india we have these institutional ethics committees um, till recently we had like institutional ethics committee or ethics committee for biomedical research involving human participants so and that was supposed to be registered uh, under dcgi drug controller of india or cidisco but uh, post 2019 um, now so for ethics committee for biomedical and research involving human participants which are observational or non interventional uh, they can apply or they can get their approval done uh, from IEC, which is registered in DHR, which is Department of Health Research in ICMR. Whereas for all other clinical trials related uh, uh, studies, the approval has to be sought from Ethics Committee, which is registered under CDISCO or, uh, or DCGI, Central Drugs uh, Standard Control Organization. Uh, there is also something called as, a, which is a new thing that they have come up with, something called as academic clinical trials. So a lot of small studies uh, which are being performed in various hospitals or in various healthcare centers, uh, they're not necessarily a standard clinical trials. So clinical trials, again, this is very important to, uh, of course, this is, uh, this is something that can be debated, but it is very important to understand that we do not go for clinical trials unless your uh, drug or your process is somehow better than the existing one. Uh, the existing or the the standard care which is present in the market right now. So we, unless it is, you know, in, in some way either with respect to cost or with respect to efficacy or safety, um, you know, in some way it is better than, it has to be better than that. Only then the approval is given for the clinical trials. We can definitely discuss or debate on this. Um, but then there are a lot of such studies which probably not, better than the, the 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 standard care but then just for the understanding there are a lot of studies which uh, take place in various academic institutes or various hospitals or uh, healthcare centers and now they are uh, they they do come under uh, uh, academic clinical trials so the approval for those uh, studies also are required to be uh, taken from ethics committee which is registered in dcgi or cidisco So uh, the approval from DCGI and CDSCO, uh, the, the ethics committee, so all interventional studies and clinical trials are required to be done there. Um, so what is the composition of uh, ethics committee? So we have a chairperson uh, who's generally non-affiliated to the respective institute. We have a member secretary uh, who is uh, affiliated to the institute. We will have a clinician, a biomedical scientist, legal experts. We need uh, lay persons. We need social scientists. So the number of members is between seven to fifteen. Uh, one ethics committee can have. Now, in DHR, uh, the ethics committee for uh, um, biomedical research involving human participants, which is registered under Department of Health Research, um, even though they suggest that you know somewhere around 15 is good but they do allow if you have more numbers uh, so let's say if you have 20 they definitely allow that but they suggest to keep it uh, close to 15 whereas ethics committee which is uh, registered under cidisco or uh, dcgi it is strictly only 15 or less than 15 so uh, if anybody is uh, looking to you know, register their ethics committee in CDSCO or anything like that. So please make sure that you don't exceed 15. We have learned the hard way. Uh, we tried it and then it, it came to be that they suggested us to keep it to 15 and then we had to remove the excess uh, members. Whereas in DHR, it is okay. Uh, they will allow you. Uh, 
So please, we can keep that in mind uh, in case if you're registering for that. Apart from that, um, affiliation, minimum 50% non-affiliated members uh, are required to be there in the ethics committee. This is again uh, with the DCG, uh, with the DHR, Department of Health Research, uh, it's okay. Uh, well, they do mention that 50% is necessary, but uh, if it is 60% or slightly more here and there, 50% uh, of affiliated, affiliated to the respective institutes and those members are there, then they do suggest that, uh, uh, you know, add more members and try to make it 50, but then uh, they're quite, quite flexible in that way. But uh, uh, the CDSCO uh, registration, they're very strict about it. They will ask you to resubmit the form with the 50% uh, non-affiliated members, at least 50% non-affiliated members. So these are the things which uh, we need to keep in mind. And then they take a lot of time because they'll take at least a month or two. Uh, so it's better when we are submitting already, we stick to the 50% 50, 50 or 7 to 15 members. Then what uh, these IECs are expected to do? Uh, the IECs should review proposed clinical trial within a reasonable time and document its weaving in writing, clearly identifying the trial, the document reviewed and, and the dates of the following. Right. So when it is actually approved, when the clinical trial is approved, um, as in like the favorable opinion uh, approval, as in it is approved to go ahead for the clinical trial. So uh, when that was given, those dates are compulsorily uh, documented. And if there are any modifications required um, for the and slight modifications here and then, and only then it can be approved uh, or disapproved, uh, those dates are required to be mentioned and also documented and also termination or suspension of uh, uh, already uh, approved uh, clinical trial uh, can also be documented. It's extremely important. Now, what uh, IEC exactly assesses? So they assess rational and need of the study why this clinical trials is important. So as I already mentioned, if there is already a care stand, uh, standard care available in the market, which is better than what you're proposing, then generally, you know, uh, it's an issue. So we have to have something which is better than already existing. For example, we're talking about semaglutamide for Alzheimer's. So what we have in Alzheimer's or any of these neurodegenerative disorders is mostly um, uh, symptomatic treatment. So they just provide, so there are loss of cholinergic uh, uh, neurons. So so they, they provide acetylcholine inhibitors. Uh, that's it. It's not really disease modifying treatment, but with semaglutide, um, so which is, which is a GLP-1 uh, agonist. So that can be a disease modifying, uh, uh, you know, a treatment and it can basically treat the patient at its cause, not really at its symptoms. So that is a good rationale to uh, sort of approve the study. And uh, IEC also assesses uh, the, how the planned study is different or better than the standard care I just mentioned and any foreseeable risks, uh, whether the benefits outweigh the risks. These are again, a very, very important aspect of uh, IEC assessment um, and then regulatory approvals. So is there proper preclinical data provided, API formulations, purifications, animal studies, uh, respective ethical approvals. For example, if you're going for animal study, then animal ethical uh, approvals or biosafety, or if you're going for stem cells, then ICSCR approvals, uh, they look for all that. And then uh, IND, which is investigational new drug submission and approvals are also sought uh, in IEC assessment. Right, so it's it also assesses a study plan, uh, how the study is planned, what is the, uh, you know, subject recruitment plan, the type of type of study, which, whether it is blinded, double blinded, randomized, uh, whether it is single centered or multi-center study. The site being selected for the study, so they do visit, uh, the IEC members do visit uh, size, whether it is feasible, whether it is planned, number of subjects can be recruited. Um, I mean, how many, whether planned number of subjects can be recruited or not, because sometimes they do mention that we can recruit more than 50 or 100 or 1000, maybe it's a very small healthcare center and, and they do not have enough number of so later on in the study, you know, they should not face that problem. So they do, uh, uh, you know, investigate all that. Uh, they investigate the uh, investigator's team, their qualification, their training, their experience. Uh, they investigate the safety information, 
clinical data management process uh, and the tools they assess, um, and then the payment and compensation to the subjects are also assessed in IEC and IRB assessment. Um, of course, IEC, IRB um, are obtained trial protocols. Um, what, what, is, what is required to be submitted? So trial protocols or any amendments to the trial protocols, written informed uh, consent forms. So the informed consent forms has to be, uh, again, submitted to the IEC and they have to assess it and approve it. Uh, subject recruitment procedures, uh, written information to be provided to the subjects uh, that this is what it is. For example, in one of our studies, I'll just give uh, take a minute. Uh, we mentioned we were working on rheumatoid arthritis and we were taking uh, uh, synovial fluid from the patients. So when we mentioned that synovial fluid is being used or taken uh, from you, um, they do not have an issue. But we do mention, but then the ethics committee raised and raised a question. They said, you have to mention that we will be using a needle, which is going to pierce and then collect that. And then you will have pain. I mean, definitely there will be pain. So you have to mention that you can't simply. So those are the things that uh, we have to mention and the proper information has to be given and uh, uh, in the informed consent. And of course, uh, investigator brochures or IBs, what they're called. Uh, available safety information, information about payments and compensation available to subjects, uh, the investigator's current uh, CV and other documentations uh, which uh, give evidence of his or her qualification, and any other documents uh, that uh, IRB or IC uh, may need to fulfill its responsibility. So whatever they ask uh, needs to be provided. So these are the documents which we need to give uh, IC or, uh, or IRB. Now, very important thing, uh, irrespective of how ready you are, maybe the site is ready, the CROs are ready, sponsors are ready, the funding is there, uh, IND approval has come, but unless the ethics committee approval is obtained, clinical study cannot be started. So there is something called a site initiation when we start the clinical trials, and then we go for uh, the, the site selection and site initiation. The site might be selected, but the site initiation cannot be done unless a proper clinical study approval is obtained. Yes, and uh, what other uh, uh, responsibilities IECs have? So it is not just approving once and then forgetting about it. It is a continuous monitoring or assessment. So IEC and IRB is expected to continuously monitor and assess the project periodically. Um, so they must fix certain period and certain stages and then they must visit um, the sites and then find out if it is still, if they are able to carry out the way they have promised or the way they have proposed. So that needs to be uh, monitored periodically. Uh, investigators and sponsors are obliged to provide access to subject files when required. Whenever IEC asks for it, they are obliged to provide those files. So continuous monitoring to assess whether the subjects are being recruited according to the approved study plan, because that often happens that you have asked for something and then, uh, uh, excuse me. Yeah, so you ask for something and then, uh, um, uh, you mention in the proposal, but then when you're, because you sometimes have a conflict of interest or you're sometimes planning to run um, parallel uh, clinical trials for, on the same subjects, uh, because, you know, the, the investigator might get uh, more money or whatever. Um, so at times uh, that needs to be seen whether the study is being, uh, the subjects are being recruited according to the approved plan. In, informed consent form is being correctly implemented or not. Any undue influence is being made on the subjects, uh, as I already mentioned, that uh, we have to see and, and like whether they are being recruited forcefully. Site is still maintaining the same standards uh, as it was during the site selection that has to be seen. Any possible deviation from the study plan is planned and whether it is documented and informed or any possible unreported uh, adverse events or severe advert ev uh, events have been uh, documented or not that needs to be seen. So. So these are the main things, but what is the role of the monitor? If we are talking about CROs, though CRO, CROs are not strictly in the part of uh, this clinical trials, but then uh, because in, in current scenario and, and the work is so much uh, that sponsors, uh, they, they go to CROs and then they sort of coordinate the whole thing. So the monitors also become very, very important to clinical trials. So they are to oversee the progress of clinical trials and to ensure that it is conducted and recorded and reported in accordance with the protocol SOPs uh, and whether they are 
you know complying with uh, icsgcp and whether they are complying with whatever they have submitted in uh, ethics committee or ethics committee approvals and and all the regulatory requirements are being followed or not uh, they have to uh, monitor and check, uh, keep checking regularly right and these guys the monitors or the cro's are the main line of communication between the sponsor and the investigator and they verify the investigator has adequate qualification or resources of course it is done at various levels so it, the iec does it and and sponsor does it but this is basically facilitated by the monitors or the cro's so they take all the uh, <clears throat> uh, their qualifications and their cvs and everything and they help uh, the investigators to submit to the iec right so they ensure that you know documents and trial supplies have been received properly and the protocol is being followed properly or not because there is plenty of money spent on that um, the, the hundreds of crores and probably thousands of crores of money is spent on the whole drug development and it becomes very important that you you don't want to miss out on something and, and the whole trial fails um, so so probably just a sponsor because sponsor wants to get things done and then cites also the successful clinical trials would sort of give them the repute that you know uh, so for that purpose uh, there need not be any manipulation i think monitor uh, has to uh, uh, follow up and then and then he has to be uh, he or she has to be vigilant about it uh, and they also have to find out or check whether the adverse events are properly being reported or not and and whether the uh, essential documents are maintained or not has to be checked so in case what happens in case of adverse events and severe adverse events um, well the planned adverse events are need not be reported to in institutional ethics committee uh, but they must be documented and which is already known that you know these are the adverse events which we might encounter so they need not be reported but they need to be documented so what is the role of uh, so this is with respect to planned but then unplanned uh, adverse events and severe adverse events uh, that is required to be reported primarily it should be re uh, reported by the uh, uh, investigator to iec uh, institutional ethics committee uh, well depending on the well they have to report it within 15 days uh, depending on the severity of uh, uh, you know the severe adverse uh, uh, <clears throat> events reporting time ranges from uh, immediately the very next morning to 15 days or 10 working days to IEC. So IST, IEC plays an important role in this. So based on that, of course, this also has to be, the investigator also has to report the same thing to the sponsor as well, uh, along with the IEC. Um, and then sponsor has to uh, coordinate with the IEC and the other regulatory bodies or something like CDSCO or DCGI uh, regarding their you know, the unplanned adverse events or SE. And then probably they, they need to go for a CAPA, which is corrective action, preventive actions. Uh, if it is, uh, you know, uh, manageable and the, the IEC and the regulatory uh, bodies do take uh, a call on that, they assess and, and then they decide whether the trial can be continued or that requires to be terminated. And ethics committee has the rights to, uh, let's say, uh, they have the right to report or they have the rights to say that, you know, certain uh, trials is not being conducted properly or you know they are not following the guidelines they are not following the icsgcp guidelines and and the and the federal uh, regulations or the respective countries um, uh, regulatory bodies uh, guidelines then they can terminate or they can at least uh, uh, send a report saying that this particular uh, study needs to be terminated so these are some of the <clears throat> okay in case of emergency and some uh, 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 severe adverse events, blinding uh, can be removed. So blinding on the investigational product may be required to be removed, but that needs to be informed to IEC, uh, Institutional Ethics Committee, as soon as possible and take approval if possible. Let's say in case of emergency that needs to be done immediately at that hour or probably like, you know, that minute, uh, then you don't really have time to sort of call and then take approval from the IEC. So you can do that, but immediately, uh, as soon as possible, you have to inform and then give uh, the justification for that and then take approval and then proceed further. Okay, so in general, uh, all clinical act trial activity requires teamwork. Uh, no single individual can achieve this alone. Um, thank you so much. And these are our references. Thank you. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions. Yeah, thanks. Thank Dr. Biswas, uh, 
Karbeshwar. Sir. Uh, for, for a very good uh, deliberation on the recent topics of ethics in clinical trial, because it yes. is a very good, uh, very essential and requirements, in, but particularly bio, conducting biomedical research. Right, and sir. he has enlightened uh, very uh, elaborately on this, you know, how to fix the protocols and follow the protocols as per the ICH guidelines and documentation particularly, then the problem facing and notice on uh, all these things and approval process. So I think it is a, a, a very good information for the scientists to be followed or those who are conducting or going for the biomedical research, clinical trials and to be followed for animal, um, uh, conducting animal experiment, yeah, human trials. So I think it will yield a very good, um, very fruitful um, uh, results uh, for the researchers to be followed. So thanks, uh, Dr. Vishwas um, Kavishwar. Thank you, sir. And now it's a, a question um, session. So I I would like to tell uh, Dr. Deepa to uh, yes. Proceed for, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, there is a question uh, from Ankur Sikta. Uh, what is IEC? Uh, this is a question I think he has answered. Uh, so I'm skipping this question. So moving to the one, uh, what is the duration of a clinical trial that also he have covered during his talk? Um, uh, I go ahead with the question of uh, from uh, um, Sefali Hota. During a six-month clinical trial, if there is any serious adverse events like uh, mortality or morbidity, or disability to the subjects, then whom among the IEC or the sponsor or the investigator will decide that the SA is drug-related or not, and who will take the decision to continue the study if requested? Um, so we have, uh, the, of course, you know, once there is a SAE that needs to be immediately reported to the sponsors and uh, the IEC, which will eventually go to uh, the regulatory bodies as well. And IECs do have clinicians. Uh, there are experts, um, so they do uh, consider and they do find out whether um, uh, this SCE is because of the drug or uh, what is it. And, and, and uh, upon proper investigation, they further take a call whether to continue or it can it needs to be terminated, as I understand. And and if anyone else wants to... The candidate is uh, maybe B farm. So IEC means uh, you tell that uh, institutional ethics committee, because yeah. to go for conducting any research, we have to... Um, uh, approve the protocols fixed by the researcher from the institutional ethics uh, committee. It may be animal ethics committee, it may be institutional ethics committee, institutional review board. These are the bodies. So yeah. it is for their information. I think now she uh, she got yeah. clarification. So uh, a couple of other things I want to add to this, sir. Uh, so generally, most of these institutions, what they do is they have their own internal uh, um, committee, which sort of uh, assesses the feasibility of the study. So they're not necessarily ethics committees. They just want to understand the feasibility of the study in their site. Uh, but apart from that, uh, of course, and they do give their reports and the principal investigators do mention all that in their, uh, in their uh, files. And then they're submitted to uh, ethics committee, institutional ethics committee. Uh, institutional ethics committee is what we call here. But then for clinical trials related uh, ethics committees in Europe, they mostly mention it as independent ethics committee because the idea is to, so it is still IEC, but in Europe, they mention it as independent ethics committee because the idea is uh, the, the whole uh, ethics committee has to be devoid of the institution there conf uh, you know, uh, for conflict of interest related issues. Uh, but in India, we have made that uh, very clear. We do call it as institutional ethics committee, but then the members present in that committee, 50% are supposed to be non-affiliated to our respective institute. And the chairperson has to be non-affiliated to the institute. So that's very, very important. Okay. And also all these, sir, please, sir. Okay, Dr. Kavishwar, because we have to proceed, I think, another yeah. lecture also before lunch. Eh? Yeah. So... I think uh, only one or two questions may be entertained because already time is late. So, uh, Dr. Manasa? Yes, please. sir. Yeah, I'm just uh, going to the, the, this is a question from uh, Dr. Kiran Kumar. So how can we perform biobility study in human volunteers at a private institution level? What are the guidelines to be followed? So again, uh, for bioavailability studies and BABA studies, we have to make a proposal and then a, a particular principal investigator in that particular institute 
um, uh, should be approached and and then they have to of course along with the sponsor or along with the company um, in their association they have to approach the institutional ethics committee and uh, and uh, send their proposal um, and based on that uh, they can take a call uh, again those uh, again if it is interventional then those um, uh, studies uh, need to be taken approval from ethics committee which are registered in cidisco uh, not uh, or DCGI truck controller of India, and not, not from DHR. DHR is only giving permission for uh, biomedical related uh, studies, uh, non-interventional studies. So, Department of Health Research. Uh, the uh, question can also be emailed to the um, uh, concerned resource person for clarification. In uh, future, also he can take care. So, all participants, you can uh, email to him. Thereby, any sort of answer possible to get from him, he can answer also. Right. Okay, so. Let's move for next speaker. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dinda and Dr. Udupa, sir. Uh, before uh, we winding up this uh, the first plenary talk, uh, I request Professor Udupa, sir, to uh, give uh, a token of love and appreciation of uh, in the form of uh, appreciation certificate on behalf of IAPST to our uh, the first plenary speaker, Dr. Vishwas Kavishwar. Uh, we are uh, very much uh, glad to share this with you, sir, with the due course of time, uh, we, we will send it to your mail ID. Please uh, accept from our side uh, on behalf of IETSP. Okay. Thank you for giving your valuable time. Let me move into the uh, next uh, session, uh, Dr. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you, sir. sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you for chairing the session. Now I request Dr. Ambika Banerji, sir, uh, and uh, Dr. Dinda, sir, to chair the session and to introduce our next plenary speaker. Dr. Srinivas Mutalik is with us. Uh, without wasting his valuable time, I request uh, Dr. Ambika Banerji, sir, to introduce our speaker, next speaker. Over to you, sir. Dr. Ambika Banerji, sir. Mr. Prem, please, please unmute your mics. Yes, sir. Yeah, Dr. Srinivas Mutalik, uh, Professor and Head, Department of Pharmaceutics, Monipal College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Monipal. We will hear from him uh, the talk on large scale manufacturing of drug loaded nanostructured lipid carriers, challenges, optimization, and evaluation. Dr. Mutalik has completed his PhD in 2004 from Monipal Academy of Higher Education and three years of postdoctoral studies from the University of Queensland, Australia, and was a visiting researcher at East Star Institute, Singapore in 2016. Dr. Mutalik has good professional experience in academics and in pharmaceutical industry at different capacities. Dr. Mutalik has published more than 175 papers in reputed journals and has 10 patents to his credit. He has, he has presented research findings at various national and international conferences and delivered several guest lectures. Dr. Mutalik has received several research grants from funding agencies like DBT, DST, ICMR, and so on and so forth, and several pharmaceutical companies. He has received several awards, like Dr. TMA Gould Medal Award for Outstanding Research, Best Poster uh, Oral Presentation Awards, Distinguished Alumni Award, APTI Young Pharmacy Teacher Award, and so on. Dr. Mutalik is supervisor for several PhD and PG students. He is the life member of various professional um, uh, organizations. And Dr. Mutalik's research interests include uh, development and evaluation of novel drug de delivery. I think we will uh, listen to his talk on the large scale manufacture of this nanoparticle. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Mutalik, over to you. You can, Mutalik, share, you can share your presentation, sir. Thank you. Srinivas, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, sir. So, first of all, I thank Urupa sir and uh, Biswajit Mukherjee sir for giving me the opportunity to talk here. The topic is drug delivery to skin by nanotechnology approaches, overview and uh, case studies. 
so this is the outline of the drug that is uh, initially i will be telling about different drug delivery systems skin and transdermal drug delivery nano carriers nano carrier related uh, skin delivery of drugs then some of the studies and uh, finally concluding remarks so coming to the drug delivery systems previously they only were considered as a means of getting the drug into the patient's body but because of the advantages associated with the novel drug delivery systems and as they have a significant effect on safety efficacy and patient compliance the focus is on development of uh, novel drug delivery systems which are designed uh, to release the drug in sustained or controlled release manner to deliver the drugs to target site and to reduce the side effects so we can we can broadly classify them as uh, the, the doses forms can be classified into a uh, different generation like conventional or unmodified and second one is controlled or sustained release drug delivery systems which may not have targeted delivery and third one is the targeted drug delivery systems which will be delivering the drugs to precisely to the particular cells and the particular cells and the tissues so this is the targeted drug delivery systems which are uh, which are generally assisted by the nano uh, carriers then drug delivery systems that introduce the drug into the body across the skin non invasively are gaining importance this is because of the advantages associated with skin which covers the surface area of around 2 m square and receives 1/3 of the blood flow it provides large surface area for drug absorption and it is most readily accessible organ of the human body so these transdermal drug delivery systems they make use of the opportunities of this easy accessibility of the skin so in this i am going to cover both uh, the topical delivery as well as transdermal delivery which is achieved by uh, nano carriers transdermal drug delivery provides controlled and continuous delivery of drugs through the skin directly into the systemic circulation maintaining efficacy while reducing the side effects they are generally available as adhesive patches and most of these uh, transdermal drug delivery systems they use passive diffusion of drug delivery some of the amphophoresis mediated patches are available but the, but they are very very minimal then transdermal drug delivery provides controlled continuous delivery of drugs into systemic okay this is the previous one so the barriers to breach the skin delivery or transdermal de drug delivery is the stratum corneum so this is the very strong barrier for the delivery of the drug across the skin as well as into the skin it is around 15 micron thick layer consists of keratinocytes and in between keratinocytes lipid layers are present so this is practically impermeable however we can breach with uh, several uh, with several formulation as well as physical or chemical means how can we breach the barrier stratum corneum one is by chemical enhancement where we are going to use chemicals for example surfactants polyalkyl sulfates etc etc next one is by physical means like antiphoresis sonophoresis electroporation and last one is by formulation manipulation by making the drug loaded microemulsions liposomes polymeric nanoparticles or lipidic nanoparticles or dendrimers so which are popularly known as nano carriers and these are the transdermal drug delivery systems first one is simple transdermal drug delivery patch they may be nano gels micro needles or nano needles also in active transdermal techniques antiphoresis electroporation sonophoresis and last one is the nano carrier loaded formulations so these are different formulations this is the patch transdermal patch and next one is the antiphoresis where low voltage current is used to deliver the drug across the skin but here the drug should be ionic that should be charged and the last one is sonophoresis application of uh, ultrasound then coming to the nano carriers so in this talk i will be covering different nano carriers for the delivery of drugs to the skin so this is the nanotechnology is nothing but the technology development at 
the scale length of 1 to 100 nanometers but for pharmaceutical applications we generally go from 10 nanometers to 1000 nanometers this nanotechnology yielded uh, significant results especially in uh, cancer treatment and hence there is a tremendous worldwide interest and what for they are used first one is prolonged release increased duration of action and decreased administration frequency improved solubility and stability they circulate in the body and penetrate tissues uh, for example enhanced permeability that is epr effect enhanced permeation and retention effect in case of tumors targeted drug delivery which protects other tissues and because of the targeting we can use lower dose then improved pharmacokinetic properties and because of targeting the harmful side effects will be reduced these are different types of nano carriers starting from dendrimers liposomes sls nlcs nanostructural liquid carriers polymeric nanoparticles microemulsions micellar systems and our interest is on dendrimers lipidic vesicles and polymeric nanoparticles for skin delivery then coming to the dendrimers uh, i'll be telling some of the case studies which we have performed in the lab so these dendrimers are artificial macromolecules which are having several attractive properties such as regular and high degree of branching multivalency nano size globular ar architecture well defined molecular weight monodispersity and precise number of sur surface groups they are like polymers but they have everything precise for example the uh, the end groups which are present and the molecular weight is also precise and uh, it is monodispersity it is not polydispersed and very very high molecular weight dendrimers may be polydispersed but it is not uh, as like as the polymers this is the a simple structure of dendrimer dendrimers are highly branched globular structure so nowadays asymmetric dendrimers they don't have globular structure but uh, they have they have several layers of branching so these are generally highly branched globular structured macromolecules containing a core moiety at the center and around this there are branching units so each in increase in each branching unit each layer of monomer will create one generation and in between so there will be several branching units and are several generations several layers of monomers and at in between these branching units there will be internal cavities and these internal cavities are hydrophobic in nature and if your drug is hydrophobic it will come and sit here it is same as that of the uh, as that of the beta cyclodextrin complex so inside cavity of beta cd is uh, hydrophobic likewise here also the internal cavities of dendrimers are uh, hydrophobic and next these are the branching units and at the end the closely packed surface groups are present so these are the surface groups and these surface groups may be amine or it may be COOH or it may be OH. Suppose if it is amine terminated, then when it is protonated, it will be NH3 plus and hence uh, we are going to get positively charged uh, dendrimers. So core is generally termed as Z0 and stepwise addition of monomer, like one layer of monomer that increases generation by one unit, two layers of monomer that monomers that increase as the generation by two units like that. There are different types of dendrimers based on architecture. They are spherical or asymmetric based on generation. They may be G1, G2, G3 based on surface groups, closely packed surface groups. They may be amine terminated, COOH terminated or OH OH terminated, reduction terminated. And they are popularly known by their by the monomers present in that dendrimers, they may be PPI, polypropylenemine. So propylenemine is the propylenemine is the monomer. Here ethylenemine is the monomer, and this is polyethylenemine. Lysine is monomer, and then this is PLL, polyl lysine. So like that. And this peptide dendrimer is nothing but there are numerous amino acids present in this. They are also called as polyamino acids. Then in our work, we, we went with the peptide dendrimers uh, because palmum dendrimers, among all the dendrimers, palmum dendrimers are widely used. They are very popular, polyamidamine dendrimers, but in vitro, they give very good results, but in vivo, they have a lot of issues, uh, toxicity, 
and uh, biodegradation problems. So these peptide dendimers are radial or wedge-like macromolecules containing several amino acids which are linked by amide bond, that is CO and H bond. Lower are no toxicity because when it enters, it will be degraded into different amino acids. And transdermal group with dendrimers uh, has received attention very recently with, uh, with, with dendrimers alone and with respect to peptide dendrimers, there were uh, no reports. Then coming to the, in, in our work, we synthesized different peptide dendrimers, purified them and characterized initially. And we adopted solid phase peptide synthesis method and they were purified by preparative HPLC and characterized by mass spec and HPLC. We synthesized six dendrimers. So this is four charged histidine terminated dendrimer, four charged arginine terminated dendrimer. It is the sequence glycine, lysine, histidine. So lysine is having two NH2 and hence two histidine molecules are added here. So these two arginine, four charge arginine and four charge histidine terminated dendrimers is they, they are having the molecular weight around 500. And next one is eight plus histidine and eight plus arginine terminated dendrimers. This is the sequence glycine, lysine, lysine two are there. So two lysine means they are having four NH2 and uh, and four histidine molecules are attached. So this these two, that is histidine and arginine, arginine terminated, eight charge dendrimer is having around 1000 molecular weight. And next one is 16 plus arginine and histidine terminated dendrimers. This is the sequence and this is around 2000 molecular weight. So we, we synthesize low molecular weight, medium molecular weight and high molecular weight vector dendrimers having different sequences and then develop the analytical method. It is, it is very hard to, it is very hard to resolve the different dendrimers. And finally, we were able to use heptafluorobutyric acid as ion pairing agent and uh, histidine terminated as well as arginine terminated dendrimers were properly resolved. Then after that, uh, our aim was to use the dendrimers in the delivery of these peptide dendrimers in the delivery of drugs into the skin as well as across the skin. And we performed the skin, but before going with a delivery of any drug, we wanted to check what is the fate of these dendrimers, whether they will be able to cross or not. So we conducted two studies that is passive diffusion. So obviously it is the, it is the initial study that is passive diffusion for the skin delivery of any agent. And next, we also went with iontophoresis. This, this is because these dentimers are having positive charge. And we wanted to check whether low voltage current will yield better permeation of these dentimers or not, so that they will be able to deliver the conjugated drugs or complex drugs uh, with them. Passive diffusion, uh, we used side-by-side -side diffusion cells. Human epidermis was the membrane. A donor was hippies. PH 4.5 and receptor was PH 7.4. Sampling was 0.2 ml. The, the diffusion cell was having the volume of 1.7 ml, donor as well as receptor. So for antiphoresis, 0.38 milliamps per centimeter square. Current was applied and silver, silver chloride electrodes were used to deliver. So silver is anode and silver chloride is cathode. So to complete the circuit, we have to put yeah, silver. Silver is anode in the donor compartment and silver chloride in the, in the uh, receptor compartment. So iontophoresis is nothing but the non-invasive method of propelling a charged and water-soluble substance transdermally with low electric current. Suppose if a, your drug is positive, then you have to put anode here. And when positive positive repulsion will take place, there is no way for the drug to escape. So it has to cross the skin so that it will deliver. That is called as electromigration. Then uh, skin permeation studies with respect to dendrimers were encouraging uh, with iontophoresis, not with passive. So six hours passive uh, diffusion, it showed, it, it showed no permeation of any dendrimer. But uh, we checked the mass spec of the receptor compartment. In HPLC, there was no permeation, but in mass spec, there, uh, the peak was observed, means little, little is penetrating, but it is not getting identified by HPLC. So we continued the study up to 24 hours. 
and only low molecular weight dendrimers were able to quantify it. That is the around 500 molecular weight. So other than that, even even with MS, we were not getting any uh, M plus H peak. In case of iontophoresis, permeation was done up to six hours, and the permeation was much better in iontophoresis. So this is the flux which is observed in the in the iontophoresis and low molecular weight dendrimers. They showed better permeation than the high molecular weight in in iontophoresis. So, and as the as the molecular weight increased, the permeation rate also decreased. So this is about the histidine dentimers and arginine dentimers. This highest one is the low molecular weight, and the lowest one is the uh, the highest one is low, and the lowest one is high molecular weight dentimers. Then we wanted to check mechanism behind iontophoresis. So what because whenever we apply current, there are two possibilities. One is electromigration, where uh, electro repulsion because of electro repulsion, electro migration will take place, and second one is electro osmosis whenever. We apply little current, there will be convective solvent flow from donor compartment to receptor compartment. And so we wanted to check which of these two mechanisms is predominantly acting here. So determining contribution of electroosmosis to observed flux. To check that with the selected uh, this is electroosmotic marker. It is not having it is it is not having effect when uh, antiphoresis is applied. So, estaminophen flux was calculated in iontophoresis in presence of each dendrimer. Suppose if a J total, that is flux total, is by electroosmosis as well as by electro repulsion, we wanted to check how much is this electroosmosis is donating towards this total flux. So, electroosmosis contribution to total flux was less. That was to that was from two percent to thirty percent, and this increased with molecular weight of the dendrimers. So this two percent was with low molecular weight. Means with low molecular weight dendrimers, electro migration was dominant, and with respect to high molecular weight, electro osmosis was dominating. However, main mechanism was electro migration. That is nothing but repulsion, and that accounted for seventy to ninety eight percent of total flux. So this clearly indicates that positive charge charge of dendrimers it drives. Them into the receptor compartment under the influence of current. So next is uh, we also used the sonophoresis effect of sonophoresis. We used vertical cell here. Human epidermis was the membrane and donor and receptor. It is same and this volume was 3.5 ml. This uh, vertical type diffusion cell and we applied up to 30 minutes. And again, analysis was uh, 30. Analysis was by HPLC. And Sonoprep, this is the machine which we used in the initial studies, but uh, when it got spoiled, then we could not get the one more because the company was uh, company was not uh, manufacturing this. Uh, probe sonicator, this is the on-off. Uh, this, these are the conditions of probe sonicator and controlled exper control experiments were also conducted because uh, when we applied the uh, sonophoresis, the temperature was found to increase to 39 degrees Celsius. So this is uh, uh, big because increased temperature uh, will also provide some uh, contribution to the flux. So we wanted to do some control experiments. And in, in case of uh, sonophoresis, I, I'm not showing the results here, otherwise it will become too much bulky, but the Sonophoresis also provided uh, good results, but iontophoresis was much better than uh, sonophoresis. After checking the fate of these dendrimers in passive diffusion with iontophoresis and with sonophoresis, we wanted to tag the drug. So we selected the drug that is 5 -FE. We selected two drugs basically one is water soluble and second one is water insoluble. Ketoprofen was selected as other drug. In this study, we studied enhancing effect of ducted dendrimers on deposition and permeation of 5FU across human epidermis. So solubility was increased in presence of ducted dendrimers. Obvious, uh, basically 5FU itself has got very good solubility. It is around 12.5 milligrams per ml in that base solution. But further, these dendrimers increased the permeation of increased solubility of this drug. And ducted dendrimers also increased the partition coefficient and it was found to be stable. 
and we conducted the studies uh, in presence of dentimers. We conducted the passive diffusion studies, and uh, it was done in two ways. One is simultaneous application, where both dentimer as well as drug were present in the uh, recept in the donor compartment simultaneously. And the second one is pretreatment application. So we here we treated the skin and then removed the treated the skin for two hours and then removed the dentimer and then drug alone was applied on the skin in the donor compartment that is pretreatment so here we used a 25 mg per ml uh, concentration of the dentimer and we used 500 microliter of that uh, solution so in 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 both the cases this arginine terminated eight charge dentimer showed better uh, formation for five and next one is uh, passive diffusion and sonophoresis and transdermal delivery of ketoprofen. This study was done, and here the aim was to determine. So, first was water soluble drug and this water insoluble drug. Here, the aim was to determine individual and combined effects of peptide dendrimer and ultrasound. So, here, arginine terminated peptide dendrimers. In the initial studies, we found arginine dendrimers are better, and then we went with that. So, peptide dendimer increased skin permeation of drug, enhancement ratio was up to 3.25, and combination of peptide dendimer and ultrasound further increased the enhancement ratio. So, next is this is about the complex of the drug. So, 5FU and uh, ketoprofen, they were complexed with peptide dendimer, not conjugated. So, we wanted to conjugate ketoprofen and make like a prodrug. So ketoprofen was chemically conjugated to dendrimer and the dendrimer part, this positive charge would improve. The hypothesis was the positive charge of the dendrimer will improve the permeation. We synthesized four conjugates around uh, almost same molecular weight, 850 to 950, around in that range. But uh, we made different charges like this is 4 plus and this is 2 plus because there are two arginine here giving four to lysine here giving four and here keto is the end and one one so it will be having two charge and this will be having uh, four charge so lysine lysine is having two lysine is end here so the one one to one ns2 keto was attached and arginine is left with two here so it is two charge and they were characterized the four uh, ketoprofen dentimer conjugates were prepared and they were characterized by mass spec DSCFTR. And we also did the skin permeation studies with iontophoresis and with sonophoresis both. So good results were obtained with, uh, with uh, we did the uh, studies by three means. One is passive diffusion, iontophoresis and sonophoresis, all three. So, but the passive diffusion studies were not Good, the results were not good, but the antiphoresis results were good. Good results are obtained with antiphoresis. So it increased, antiphoresis increased ketoprofen skin permeation from conjugates, and we got very good results with D2 conjugate. D2 conjugate is nothing but around 823 molecular weight. This is the four charge, so this positive charge might have improved the skin permeation, and this is lysine terminated. And ketoprofen is presented in the center. So here it is present in the uh, periphery. So next is we did the skin permeation studies uh, in mice, that is in vivo. So plasma concentration of ketoprofen was higher from D2 conjugate, and D2 conjugate exhibited highest in utero skin permeation. And encouraging results were obtained with antiphoresis. The other one was not good that is the sonophoresis but these uh, the results when we showed the actual results the journal uh, accepted the negative results as well so, so with sonophoresis we did not get well with passive diffusion we did not get good results and only with antiphoresis it was showing better so then we we concluded that antiphoresis is better delivery mechanism for the conjugates or the complexes when we use these when we use these uh, peptide dendrimers. And next is uh, with respect to vesicles, um, that is the lipidic vesicles, nanolipidic vesicles we used uh, uh, for the delivery of drugs. 
in one of the studies uh, we the aim was to develop and evaluate nanovesicular transdermal formulation of snp and malate it is having very low oral bioavailability around 2% and so the approach was to and this, this is the dentimer that is pd1 and we also did the lipidated peptide dentimer that is pd2 it is it is combined with oleic acid and this is the peptide dentimer non lipidated and this is the uh, the drug is having low permeation due to uh, stratum carnem properties as well as drug properties and we used two dentimers lipidated and non lipidated and we wanted to deliver this uh, using liposomes as well so we wanted to conjugate these peptide dentimer on the surface of on the surface of these liposomes and we also wanted to put transferrin we tried this we we conjugated transferrin as well and this is the peptide dentimer which is present and esnafen malate is present within the liposome so initially we conducted several studies by using only dentimer and finally we wanted to mix both lipidic vesicles as well as peptide dentimer we made these lipidic vesicles as cationic and then again these peptide dentimers were placed because in our previous studies we found that peptide dentimers will also act as permeation enhancers and we wanted to exploit both the possibilities the liposomal nano liposomal as well as the peptide dentimer but finally we found that it is uh, the the system is increasing the permeation that is intra cellularly as well as through the hair follicle so high permeation of drug we did confocal studies for this and it showed the permeation across the uh, hair follicles as well so high permeation of drug due to transport of nano carrier and permeabilization of stratum carnem by pl and pd that is liposome as well as peptide dentimer and next one is uh, the there is some disturbance of this liposomes are prepared by thin film hydration method the size is less than 100 and this is the transmission electron microscopic image and passive in passive dif passive diffusion antiphoresis and sonophoresis there is no much skin permeation only with uh, the drug and nano liposomes they showed better permeation and when the nano liposomes were conjugate were combined with antiphoresis and nano liposomes were combined with sonophoresis the results were better and then it to yes, interfere yes. a little bit dr sinivas little bit fast and because ah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah 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 sure sir so in case of cytotoxic sonophoresis the result ah okay found to be uh, we are found to be non toxic we did the mtts in hackard cells and in mechanistic visualization of skin penetration of these uh, these nano systems we used confocal laser scanning microscopy and we got very good results with liposome that is containing pd2 pd2 is nothing but lipidated peptide dentimer and where sonophoresis is used as delivery mechanism so this is how these these are the confocal laser scanning images which shows better permeation of the drug into deeper layer of the skin so that it, it went around 350 microns so same results were observed with antiphoresis and in case of pharmacokinetic studies the results were better compared to the oral peroral uh, formulation and transdermal control and liposomal pd2 snp and formulation so here the here the results are better than this uh, this formulation that is third one then this is the this is very very big study and these are the inferences so peptide based liposomes peptide dentimer based liposomes were developed for transdermal delivery 
and one was liquidated and one was non liquidated both considerably in the permission of sdf and malyd and when we conjugated with uh, peptide dentimer and finally transferring a uh, considerably increased sdf and malyd permeation in um when it was incorporated when pd was incorporated all liposomes showed synergistic permeation enhancement with sonophoresis as well so no toxicity was found then mechanistic evaluation revealed considerable trans follicular penetration depicted by the formulations uh, by the confocal laser scanning microscope and sustained and sustained release as well as battery absorption was found in the in vivo studies then in another study uh, easy cc and hl loaded nano transferosomes were uh, formulated uh, with the lipidic nano lipidic vesicles and we used ha as biocompatible polymer and easy cc as antioxidant and we used dentimers in this formulation as well and this is the transmission electron microscopic image which also shows the lipidic bilayer of these liposomes and in vitro skin permeation profile of easy cc alone easy cc transferrin and transferosome and optimized transferosome so here uh, optimized transferosome showed better permeation and which is uh, which is again because of the peptide dentimer that is present and we did lot of studies in this a uh, lot of experiments in this uh, work and it finally showed the formulation showed excellent uh, sun, sun production factor no skin toxicity good in vivo antioxidant effect with respect to gss catalase and sod high skin permeation and no in vivo skin permeation of ecg then coming to the this these are several studies with what we have conducted with the dentimers alone and then we we included dentimers in the nano liposomes and apart from that we we tried to exploit the presence of peptide dentimer in the polymeric nanoparticles but we did not get much success in in the presence of dentimers in polymeric nanoparticles with respect to liposomes or uh, with respect to transferosomes when we used dentimers we got very good results and different mechanisms we try to exploit like the passive diffusion and porosis and so on of course so then coming to the uh, conclusion transdermal system design what's ahead delivery of larger molecules it is always challenge to deliver across the skin and this is one of the areas where we can concentrate and second one is materials and formulations to reduce skin irritation to enhance the adhesion profile and to improve comfort and wear so always we we deal with the drug delivery into the transdermal route or into the topical route into deeper layer of the skin etc but the formula to make the process forms finally we need the materials the polymers or the lipids or the materials to make the patches so that is less focused area and we can concentrate on the development of different materials and next one is nano carriers for selective localization within different skin layers so generally we use these nano carriers to to deliver the drug deeper into the skin and obviously that will go to the blood stream and if if we are aiming to deliver the drug to different layers for example in the uh, psoriatic skin or in in case of it should go to the deeper layer but it should not go into the blood stream or into the upper part that is epidermis that is one of the areas where we can concentrate for the selective localization of the drug within the skin layers then next one is addressing the stability issues of nano carriers in final formulations so final formulations will be generally the ointments or the creams or the patches containing these nano carriers where they undergo the degradation so the stability or shelf life is the issue with the nano carriers when they are present in the final formulation it may be gel or the cream so that is one of the areas where we can focus with respect to the stability issues of the nano carriers in the final formulation so i'd like to acknowledge iipst for giving me the opportunity to speak here uh sdm university dharwad east west college of pharmacy bangalore and my coach west bengal so i sincerely thank mukherjee sir for giving me the opportunity and uh, and udupa sir also so udupa sir is my phd guide as well i always uh, acknowledge sir support throughout my career and my research scholars phd students and colleagues who help in the research without whom it is not possible next is yamcops and mahai for facilities and without proper funding it is not 
possible to take up the research. So I acknowledge all the funding agencies, government as well as private. Then uh, without good collaboration, it is difficult to carry out the complex studies. So UQ, Australia, King's College, London, Naipur, then Bitskilani, Hyderabad. Uh, then uh, Taiwan, we have tie up with the two universities there. So I acknowledge all the support of all these collaborators. Thank you. Thank you, very Thank you Dr. Srinivas Mutalik for giving a very good insight into the formulation uh, using nano technology and uh, using the materials like uh, dendimus, uh, like uh, uh, the lipid, li lipid as well as non-lipid dendrimers and the li liposomes uh, used as a carrier at nanoforms and conjugating uh, using this mechanism, particularly the chemical structure and the functional groups where you are contributing with the uh, drugs, particularly anti-cancer drugs and targeting through transdermal route and the uh, two mechanism you utilized iontophoresis and sonophoresis and now you compared how iontophoresis uh, mechanism or say sonophoresis techniques which you used to, to enhance the permeation to the skin and targeting to the site. It was very good um, elaborative and uh, practical oriented and uh, you have uh, cited some of your practical examples as well and it is published in good uh, impact factor journal I have seen. So um, it will definitely give uh, uh, information to the new uh, researchers and scientists to concentrate on this area. Some of my students are also doing on this transdermal, particularly using this nanotechnology in targeting uh, anti-cancer drugs. So uh, this is a very important uh, because anti-cancer drugs, uh, people get a lot of side effects through oral route or uh, parenteral route um, delivery. So I think uh, this is a highlighted area and presently so many scientists are concentrating on this area. And when you particularly the materials you used, uh, used particularly lipophilic or non-lipophilic materials and how you are conjugating uh, with them by techniques and uh, you have given comparative statement how it is improving uh, the techniques like uh, antiphoresis and sort of so I think uh, people um, will be benefited out of your presentation and they will concentration to um, concentrate to do some uh, very good output on this particularly pharmaceutical research. So now it's a time for the, uh, because time is very short, we have to go for lunch. Uh, one, two, three uh, questions can be uh, handled. Then I'll hand over to the Ambika uh, sir to uh, conclude uh, his uh, means uh, deliberation. So now uh, to uh, Dr. Deepa, you can proceed for the questions. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, this is a question from uh, <clears throat> Mr. Sanjeevan Sarkar. Uh, the question is like this. Does demography affects the de drug delivery efficiency of uh, TDDs? Uh, if yes, uh, sir, places where temperature is high and perspiration is high. Uh, this is, uh, if, we, if it is difficult to follow, you can uh, please click the question and answer box. Uh, the question from Sanjeevan Sarkar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the question is dropped in the QA section at the bottom. Sir. In the QA section? Last demography affects the can delivery you, efficiency of TDDs. Can you yeah. able to? Yeah, it obviously affects where the temperature is high, but uh, the temperature will not be so much uh, varied in the, in the body. So uh, usually, uh, usually it is considered as 32% as ideal, uh, tempera ideal temperature to conduct the studies. And uh, uh, in, in many reports, considering the in vivo conditions, 37 degrees uh, conducted. So plus or minus one, one degree uh, maybe a lot and more than that, I think it will not be uh, varied so much. And with the little increase and little in, uh, little decrease of the, uh, we conducted all the in vitro studies using the human skin and with the little bit decrease or with little bit increase of the temperature that did not affect so much the permeation because in case of sonophoresis, we found the temperature is going uh, beyond 39, 39.5 degrees Celsius. But when we conducted the control studies, we did not find so much uh, so much change in the permeation. So I, I don't think unless the temperature is varied so much, or for example, in case of uh, uh, hyperthermia, or which is used for the cancer treatment, where it will be on up to 43 degrees. So unless it is going more than 40, 
Digger sales, yes, the permission may not be affected so much. That's the thing. And coming to the this demography, uh, question arise day because uh, you are using lipophilic material and uh, trying through the lipophilic uh, transdermal barrier. So definitely yes, question yes. stability and permeability. When you also use sonoporosis yes, yes. and all techniques, uh, there may be chances of uh, irreversible damage to the skin also. And uh, yes, when yes. trying the uh, anti-cancer drug, that's why this type of question definitely it will arise and a very good question. And uh, yes, I yes. think he tried with the stability problems and all uh, with the mm -hmm. temperature yes. variation. It is also, I think, uh, more and more also uh, the research uh, is going to be done on yes, this sir, area sir. to ascertain yes, the sir. toxicity manifestation, uh, I think. Yes, sir. Whenever temperature increase is required, we have to go with the high, high transition lipids like uh, DPPC yeah, or, yeah. or DSPC in the formulation instead of simple SPC, which will be having degradation at a little bit higher temperature. We should change the, we should alter the lipid composition. DSPC is good lipid. We can partially replace SPC or EPC with the DSPC and go with the formulation. Is it that lipophilic and non lipophilic both can conjugate to give more stability? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Next question. Yes, the question from uh, Lokesh Chandra. Can uh, let me take this as a last question, so because most of the rest of the question here were answered during his talk. Uh, so probably I request the delegates to go ahead the YouTube link to uh, yeah. uh, go for a further That's clarification the of their doubt. So let me take this question as the last question from Lokesh yes. Chandra Mahata. How the agglomerated nanoparticles can be restored in uh, into nano-sized particles, and how we can avoid agglomeration of the nanoparticles is the question from Lokesh Chandra. Agglomerated, actually, when they agglomerate, uh, obviously it is it is difficult to again resuspend in the same state how they were previously. We can increase the charge. That is the only thing. Uh, up to plus uh, plus thirty, some people will say and uh, more than plus 20 so like that adequate positive charge is uh, enough to to have good physical stability but once the agglomerate it is difficult we tried in one of the experiments we tried and we have not uh, seen a lot of literature in that area also and we tried to redisperse using uh, sonophorus using uh, ultrasound by using probe sonicator as well as water bath sonication they were getting separated but again the size was getting increased. So once they agglomerate, it is difficult, especially in case of uh, uh, lipidic vesicles. Uh, can I, think, uh, I think uh, this agglomeration, uh, if I am not wrong, this yes. controlling the surface charges of the particle, and particle size is very important, you know. So yes, if sir, you yes. control that surface charges, then it will control the agglomeration. So uh, to prevent the, yeah, so that is very important and the size and the characteristics of the lipophilic material, I think, and the surfactant. And once the agglomeration, yeah, once agglomeration takes place, it is difficult to redisperse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why we have to be very conscious and uh, the surface charges only you have to control while formulating and the particle size and the surface charges. And that depends on the, uh, you know, the homogenization uh, parameters and all these things and the charge, yes, size and the uh, the characteristics of the uh, surfactants you choose in for this. I think uh, this is uh, to solve the questions and such, yes, I think so. So next. I, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mutalik, for giving your valuable time and uh, your busy schedule to share with us. I request Prem Kumar to, uh, I request technical person to, uh, yeah. Um, I request Dr. Ambika Banerjee, sir, to join for the uh, certificate uh, handover for, on behalf of the IAPST. We thank uh, for, from the core of our heart on behalf of the IAPS to be thank uh, Dr. Mutalik to give his valuable time with us and uh, a great applaud to you. Due course of time, we'll send this certificate to your mail address. Sir. Thank you so much once again. I request Dr. Ambika Banaji sir to join. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mutalik. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mutalik. Nice talk, good research. I think the thank participants you, have been benefited. The students, research scholars, teachers, all have a good time listening to you. Good research and excellent talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Panaji, sir. And uh, 
Yes, it's a, uh, I can understand. There is a lot many questions you have. We can connect you the speaker through the email. You can uh, write your question and uh, uh, you can clarify it later after the session or the, at the end of the day. And uh, one more benefit for you, all the delegates, you can check the YouTube link from that. You can hear the lecture. You will get an, one more chance if you missed it. So I request uh, uh, now all the delegates and the dignitaries to have a quick uh, lunch break. Uh, we we are on, uh, as per scheduled time, we are uh, uh, going ahead. So let me meet by 2 o'clock for the post session. Yes, let's meet uh, at 2 o'clock. Thank you, Mursa so Have would, a nice I would lunch. Just, I would just further uh, request uh, Dr. Mutali. He just left, I think. If you could, if you, he would uh, share his presentation to us, like slide, yes, he sir, would uh, yes. email us. That would be. Yes, sir, yes, sir. And all the data, everything is uh, in the public domain, in the published papers. I'll share any of the presentation.